10 minutes at the opening or yeah a- aiming for 10 minutes yeah okay cool but if, if it's shorter or a little bit longer don't uh you know don't worry mm-hmm. no no debate judges here today yeah <laughs> I'm secretly keeping a scorecard now. <laughs> Let's be honest, we all are. <laughs> I just want to check that it's gone live properly on YouTube. There we go. Awesome. Uh, so we are live now then. Um, and I've got Kyle and Camel here with me. Kyle is a Christian. He's going to be presenting the orthodox uh, Christian case, defending that case for the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Camel is going to be talking about why naturalism uh, has a more probable explana- presents a more pro- probable explanation for the resurrection case. Um, and so he's, he's going to go first and pr- put that forward. Carl's going to put forward his case. They're going to cross-examine each other, and then we'll go into open discussion. And any of you guys who are in the chat as well, feel free to put questions forward throughout, and I'll try and uh, take a note of them. Um, so do you want to go first then, Camel, and introduce yourself and then get into the argument? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So hi, um, I'm Camille. Um, so thanks to Kyle and Nathan for organizing this, and I hope we're going to have a very productive discussion. Uh, so first of all, let me start by saying that I will be actually offering an alternative hypothesis to the resurrection hypothesis, which I think is more probable, which means that I won't be just you know poking holes in the resurrection hypothesis and raise doubt. Um, and second of all, uh, there's just a couple of things that I'm granting for the sake of argument. Uh, so I'm granting in this debate that Yahweh exists, uh, not just any God, but specifically the God of um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, then I'm granting that miracles do actually happen, uh, including bodily resurrections. I'm granting that there are actually five independent sources for the resurrection. So the pre-Pauline creeds preserved in the Pauline epistles, various speeches preserved in Acts, uh, the authentic letters of Paul, uh, the the synoptic gospels and acts and finally the gospel of john uh, and then finally i'm granting that the gospels were actually written in the genre of greek historical biographies um, so what are the two uh, competing hypotheses uh, first of all there's the resurrection hypothesis which uh, let's just grant for the sake of argument that it does actually account for the evidence uh, the problem obviously is that it's very impossible even if it's the case that uh, it actually exists, uh, just because of natural theology, which is the branch of theology that allows us to learn about Yahweh just by observing the natural world. Uh, It's the foundation, for example, behind the uh, fine-tuning argument. And from natural theology, we can conclude that Yahweh has a very strong tendency not to raise people. And at face value, it's improbable that he would make an exception with Jesus. And of course, there are various arguments for thinking that he would make an exception. But the problem is that all of them are either circular, they are non sequiturs, they are ad hoc, or they are based on premises that are not in evidence. Uh, We can get to some of those reasons later. Uh, So my uh, alternative is called the Old Testament hypothesis, uh, which says that early Christians believed the Old Testament to be a historically reliable source of information about Jesus. And then they mistook their religious experiences for confirmations of this belief. So specifically, early Christians believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and they believe that the Old Testament describes what the Messiah will do. Uh, So they naturally believe that this is what Jesus did, even though he didn't actually do some of those things, right? So for example, they believe that the Old Testament says the Messiah will suffer for sins of others, uh, that he will be humiliated and killed, and that he will be then raised, lifted up, and highly exalted in heaven. And to be honest, uh, Jesus really did uh, do a lot of those things. Uh, For example, he really was despised and rejected. He was uh, tortured, um, stricken, and spat upon. He was led as a lump to the slaughter. Uh, His hands and feet were pierced, and so on and so forth. So uh, early Christians concluded that he did even the things that he didn't actually do, like uh, suffer for sins of others, or was raised, lifted up, and highly exalted in heaven. And then they had religious experiences, which they mistook as confirmations of this view. Uh, So how does this um, hypothesis explain the evidence, right? So let's start with the narratives of the empty tomb uh, found in the Gospels. Um, So Isaiah uh, 53 verse 9 says, they made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. And uh, according to my hypothesis, the Gospel authors just mistook 
uh, mistakenly believe that uh, here Isaiah is talking about Jesus. Uh, so uh, when they wrote the Gospels, they wrote a story about Jesus's burial in a rich man's grave, which is consistent with the source being Isaiah. And then they added details on top uh, of the source uh, based on their existing beliefs. So for example, early Christians were second temple Jews. So they believe specifically in a physical resurrection of the body. So if you have a body that's believe, buried in a rich man's grave and it undergoes a physical resurrection, well, that tomb becomes becomes empty. So when they wrote the Gospels, they depicted uh, a tomb being empty. And we know that authors of Greek historical biographies uh, frequently invented uh, details on top of what their sources said to create what they thought is a plausible narrative of what actually happened. And this was a standard literary practice at the time. It wasn't considered de deceptive. And the audience actually understood that this is normal. Uh, so it's important to realize that they were not lying or they were not trying to scam people with a fictional story, right? Uh, the problem is that they mistakenly, they mistakenly believe that the Old Testament talks about Jesus. Uh, so they treated it as a historically reliable source. And this literary devices theory is very plausible. In fact, there are even many uh, very conservative evangelical scholars who subscribe to it, right? So you don't have to be uh, like a liberal Christian because it's uh, being endorsed even by people like McLaughlin, Craig Keener or Craig Evans. Uh, so they would say, for example, that the author of the Gospel of John move the day of the crucifixion uh, to uh, a different day than the synoptic gospels for theological reasons. And therefore he invented all kinds of historical details around that. Uh, Mike Laconau, for example, thinks that the gospel of Matthew might have invented the crucifixion signs as apocalyptic imagery, right? So for example, the resurrection saint of saints. Uh, or he thinks that the infancy narratives in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke might be largely invented because, uh, and I quote, little was remembered of Jesus's childhood. And that's why most details only appear in one Gospel or and not uh, the others. So uh, then there are the appearance narratives in the Gospels. Uh, for example, Jesus meeting two disciples on the road to a mouse, uh, Jesus eating a piece of fish, uh, Thomas touching Jesus's wounds. Uh, those are, I'm explaining again as stories created by the gospel authors as a combination of their existing beliefs, namely that Jesus was raised bodily, and what they thought are historically reliable sources. So in this case, they would receive from previous Christians that Jesus appeared to his disciples, so they created a plausible narrative depicting it as they would imagine it. Imagine it. And again, there are even very conservative evangelical scholars like, uh, like Hona, Keener, or Craig, who think that this kind of narrative flexibility, which was very frequently employed by authors of Greek historical biographies, even applies to the resurrection appearances. Uh, for example, they might think that the Gospel of John invented the story of doubting Thomas for theological reasons, and that's why it doesn't show up in any other gospel or that the author of the Gospel of John might have invented Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit into the, his disciples when he appeared to them after the resurrection. Uh, so again, this is very plausible. Uh, then there is the appearance narrative is in 1 Corinthians 15, which I'm granting uh, goes all the way back to the Jerusalem pillars, uh, you know, Peter, James, and John. Uh, I'm just explaining it as early Christians mistaking their religious experiences for a confirmation of their existing belief that Jesus was raised. And there is obviously a number of purely natural phenomena with external existence, which can explain this, uh, even for groups of people. So we don't have to appeal to, for example, hallucinations or things that only exist in the mind of an individual and cannot be shared by a group of people. And out of uh, many, many possible explanations like that, I'm just picking one as an explanation, and that's pareidolia, which is a human tendency of incorrectly perceiving stimulus as a meaningful pattern. And this is actually very common in religions around the world, not just in Christianity, where believers see images of religious figures, uh, for example, Jesus or Mary, in things like cloud formations, tree barks, rocks, walls, windows, uh, even things like uh, ultrasound or X-ray images, uh, images of telescopes, uh, telescope images of nebulas, um, or even foodstuffs like uh, toasts, uh, pizzas, or tortillas. And in many instances, uh, pareidolia seriously strengthens existing sincere religious beliefs, and it makes believers much more confident that what they already believe is true. And many instances of pareidolia actually become very highly prized possessions, or they become places of worship, and uh, like entire churches are, are built around them. Um, so again, this is very plausible. Uh, then there is a conversion of Paul. Uh, 
in this case, my uh, hypothesis is not very innovative. I'm just explaining very explaining very standardly as a guilt uh, induced delusion. I will just defer to Mike Lacona, who says that if there was only one apostle who hallucinated, then a hallucination would be a better hypothesis than a resurrection. So in my explanation, there is just one guy who have hallucinated. So there you go. Uh, and then there is everything else. Uh, so like uh, the transformed lives of, lives of the disciples, uh, their martyrdom, a spread of Christianity, uh, shifting the main day of worship from Saturday to Sunday and so on. And all of these things can be explained by a sincere but false belief in the resurrection, just as well as they can be explained by a true belief. Uh, and I can explain where a sincere but false belief came from, uh, which means that I can explain all of those pieces of evidence as well. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, the Old Testament hypothesis explains all of the evidence at least equally well, but is, has a much higher plausibility because I don't need to appeal to anything we know almost never happens. Uh, we know that the resurrection is something that Yahweh almost never does. Uh, but instead, I'm appealing to things that we know happen all the time. Uh, so it's built, for example, on widespread features of human psychology and on well-documented uh, ancient literary conventions. So thank you for your attention. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that, Camel. Um, so now, I guess, Kyle, if you want to put forward um, your side of the case, and I think you've got yourself muted at the minute, yeah. Um, do, you, do you have slides to share as well? Do you want to set that up and then... Um, uh, no, actually, I was going to go like a fairly technical okay. route in terms of talking about the probabilities. I decided against that just because I figured that probably put most people, including us, to sleep. Okay, no problem. So, well, feel, yeah, just feel free to get into uh, your side of it then, and I'll, uh, you know, loosely keep track of time again. Okay, awesome. All right, so Camille sets forward this thing which he calls the Old Testament hypothesis. The main issue, or let's say the first issue, is that the Old Testament hypothesis proper is not a hypothesis that explains all of the data about the resurrection. It only explains some of the data. Um, calling it a hypothesis uh, in a kind of collective term runs a danger of being somewhat misleading. I don't think uh, Camille is trying to do that, um, but I think we just need to keep that in perspective here. In reality, uh, within Camille's paper, which he sent me, there are about 20 hypotheses or so altogether, uh, even if we grant all of them a 0.5 probability given the resurrection, uh, get, or excuse me, given that the resurrection did not occur, uh, they all have a 0.5 probability given that the resurrection did not occur, uh, the odds that all of these things came together would be 0 0.00000095. Uh, we start to get more, or we will start to get more of uh, on some of the issues with the other sub-hypotheses later. Um, for none of the other sub-hypotheses or any of them besides the Old Testament hypothesis proper, uh, Camille doesn't offer any positive evidence for why we should think that happened, only that it could explain what's going on. Um, but for now, let's just get mostly to the Old Testament hypothesis, uh, which I think actually starts out at a much lower probability than 0.5, given that the resurrection did not occur. Uh, this hypothesis is itself unlikely given not re that the resurrection did not, did not occur. Uh, and that's because it's unlikely given general human experience when uh, even when we have a be beloved Messiah, a beloved teacher, a beloved friend, they die. It's just very, very, very rare in human experience for anybody to go around saying they rose from the dead. And it would take a lot for an individual to go out into the world where he was just very publicly killed and say that uh, he is, that your friend is no longer dead. Uh, it fails to account for the many other messianic claimants and why nobody who thought they were the Messiah predicated of those claimants that they had risen from the dead uh, because they were the Messiah. There were many other people uh, within the first and second centuries, we know this courtesy of Josephus, that claimed to be the Messiah. A good number of them had very good followings. A good number of them were very well beloved. Uh, in some cases, much more so than Jesus along kind of nationalistic lines, uh, especially insofar as they uh, decided or claimed that they would challenge Roman rule, which is something that most of the people at that time thought the Messiah should do or be able to do. But in all cases, the Romans came down on those messianic claimants, uh, squelched them, and everybody went about their days denying that they ever even knew that messianic claimant. Um, so it's kind of unlikely that this would randomly happen here with Jesus, the guy who 
actually ticked off a whole bunch of Jewish people for all kinds of reasons, challenging their uh, prior practices, uh, challenging their status as a unique conduit of God to mankind, because Jesus said that the Gentiles are now basically on par with the Jews in terms of spirituality. There's all kinds of reasons. It would just be really strange for this to be the one Messiah that so happens to, to have resurrection predicated of him just because people thought he was the Messiah. Uh, even in cases where people did expect a resurrection, uh, when the resurrection, surprise, surprise, didn't happen, uh, they dropped it. We have an example of French prophets going to England in uh, the early 18th century, around 1708. They said that one of ours has fallen ill and died. Uh, his name was Dr. Thomas Ems. They put it in the newspaper, come to the cemetery around this time. He will rise from the dead, come watch it. Uh, all the townsfolk came. They came with uh, pitchforks and torches as more of a mob than anything else. Shockingly, Dr. Thomas Ems did not rise from the dead. Uh, it's no surprise to anybody, there's a reason we're not still talking about Dr. Thomas Ems. And these French prophets didn't try to say, well, he rose from the dead elsewhere, or he rose from the dead, but he's invisible. No, they just dropped it. They said he didn't rise from the dead. And of course, they blamed the mob for being too unruly and scaring Dr. Thomas Ems away. Uh, but they, they just dropped it. And so there, there's no reason to think that given that the resurrection did not occur, the early followers of Jesus would have done, done anything differently. Indeed, the most likely thing to happen given the resurrection not occurring by far is absolutely nothing. Christianity never starts. The disciples go back to being fishermen and tax collectors and whatever they were beforehand, in all likelihood deny all knowledge of having known Jesus because they saw how brutally the authorities had cracked down on him. Uh, so the Old Testament hypothesis itself starts off as unlikely, but it, it gets a little bit worse for uh, Camille's theory here. Uh, he relies on two kind of uh, biblical passages or two ideas with, within the history of uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, to support this idea that uh, the disciples would have believed Jesus had risen from the dead because he was the Messiah. The first is he appeals to Hosea 11 as a messianic passage uh, or he appeals to Matthew's reference to Hosea 11 as a messianic passage. The problem is uh, we, we have all kinds of lists of rabbinic lists of messianic passages and Hosea 11 doesn't appear in any of them. The reason Matthew was appealing to Hosea 11 is not because it's messianic. Uh, the son being brought out of Egypt is not a messianic reference proper, but the rest of it goes on to talk about how God was among them. Uh, it, there's, there are themes which vibe together in these, in these two passages with what Matthew was going into talking about and what the rest of Hosea 11 is about. The really big issue with uh, some of Camille's factual claims. Uh, he claims Second Temple Jews uh, would have had no problem believing that their Messiah would have risen from the dead because they believed people rose from the dead. Uh, that's not true. They believed that people would rise from the dead at the end of the age. They wouldn't, they, there's no reason to think that they believe somebody would rise from the dead uh, three days after their death. The, um, the idea that they believed in bodily resurrections shortly after death is just factually incorrect. Um, all of that makes the prior probability of this Old Testament hypothesis e even lower than it already is. Uh, and even worse yet, and this is the most indicting thing about the Old Testament hypothesis, is that the Old Testament hypothesis doesn't actually explain anything. Why would the disciples think Jesus was the Messiah if he was not in fact the Messiah and did nothing to indicate that he was the Messiah before they predicated it of him? They believed he rose from the dead because, he, because they believed he was the Messiah, why on earth did they believe he was the Messiah in the first place, especially if he had been publicly killed in brutal fashion for all to see in an extremely humiliating way for both Christ and his followers? What, what kind of plausible story can we possibly tell where one disciple looks at the other and says, well, uh, that happened, this sure sucks, but uh, he's the Messiah, so we know he rose from the dead even though none of us have ever actually seen him bodily, he hasn't appeared to us or anything, but hey, we saw his face in the clouds. Uh, that's the big problem with Camille's hypothesis here. It, the, there, there is no way to spin this where it sounds remotely plausible given our other experiences with other religions or experiences with just general human behavior. Uh, there are other issues with some of the sub hypotheses. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time to get to those. I reject Lacona. I have reasons for that. I hope Camille uh, will ask me about that. Um, I don't have time to get to it here. Uh, Camille, uh, Camille's Old Testament hypothesis and the sub-hypotheses give no adequate explanation for why it would have been said that 
two women were the first witnesses to get to the tomb. Women were not accepted as witnesses, as credible witnesses in Jewish society at that time. He gives no, uh, he gives, gives no adequate explanation of uh, Paul converting to Christianity besides a just so story. He offers no uh, positive evidence and frankly, it doesn't sound like all that plausible of a story for an up and coming rock star uh, religious figure to suddenly start feeling bad and then sacrifice all life and limb to turn around and become a member of this religion that he had previously been persecuting uh, and suddenly claim he believed all kinds of new things that he had no reason to believe. Uh, the, the biggest issue, and I didn't leave myself much time to get to it, is that uh, Camille's uh, view of the prior probability of uh, Christ rising from the dead or of the resurrection occurring given our background knowledge is a bit misguided. He applies something in probability called the straight rule. Uh, there's all, kind of liter all kinds of literature and the probability and inference literature, especially within philosophy of science literature about why the straight rule is problematic, saying that God has a tendency not to raise all these other uh, hundreds, billions of people or however many people have existed, therefore he would not raise this person from the dead. Uh, just there's all kinds of reasons to think why that would not be a, a good inference. Uh, one example, a, a more practical example, would be to say that, well, um, I have a tendency to not marry all of the presumably hundreds of millions of marriageable women in the world, so why would I have a tendency to marry the one that I did marry? Um, it becomes even more unlikely when you see how pretty she is, but we, we can't say I have a, a tendency to not marry all those, therefore it's incredibly unlikely that I'd marry the woman I did. There's something going wrong here. Uh, not to mention, even if we say, well, yeah, it's just incredibly unlikely that I married a, a girl who was named Evelyn Aguilar, who is now uh, uh, Evelyn Hewitt, perfectly normal uh, evidence can overcome that very, very easily. Um, I can show you a birth certificate. Similarly, somebody could overcome the incredible Im improbability of Jesus rising from the dead of seeing their former friend and Messiah and being able to tell a dead person from a dead person. Um, I have reasons why I think we can reset the prior probability given messianic claims made about Jesus, even if most of them, uh, even if we don't grant that most of them are true. But at the end of the day here, what we need to do is get into the actual probabilities, discussing the probabilities set by the evidence instead of operating on a misconception of what the prior probability is and telling uh, just so stories that are themselves in many cases implausible, in many cases don't even explain what they're supposed to explain and then scotch taping them all together in an incredibly implausible fashion. Um, and so, so that's ultimately my critique of this paper. Awesome, so thanks for that, Kyle. Um, what we'll get into now then is in this cross-examination cross section, if you would like to ask Camel some specific questions that he can um, answer defend, defending his position. And then after a short period of time, we'll kind of flip the script and then go straight into some open dialogue, just so you get it, we get a chance to kind of like specifically see each person defending their, their views rather than it, you know, get it getting all mixed in. Um, so do you, want, do you want to go ahead with that, Kyle? What would be one of your first um, questions or, or objections to throw Camel's way? Oh, gosh. Uh, first one, given something that I was just riffing on quite a bit, why do you think it's explanatory or sufficiently explanatory to say they predicated the resurrection of Jesus because they believe, believe that he was the Messiah? Uh, well, I think, so the question is, um, why did the disciples thought that, think that Jesus is the Messiah in the first place? Or if they thought that he's the Messiah, how did they infer from that that he was raised? Uh, which one of the two questions you want to answer? So th these two questions are going to ride together. We need to ask why they thought he was a Messiah in the first oh, place. Oh yeah, sure, and, sure. And, okay. and why, uh, they, why they were so certain of it that they could very confidently predicate of him that he had risen from the dead despite all evidence being to the contrary. Yeah, sure. So, the, so if the question is why did the uh, followers of Jesus thought that he's the Messiah, uh, well, I think the uh, simplest exp explanation is because he said he is, uh, and they believed him, which is not impossible because, as you uh, yourself pointed out, uh, there were a lot of apparently messianic claimants running around with a lot of followers. So, claiming that you are the Messiah and then other people believing you is not very impossible, even if you are not. 
in the first century Palestine. And then if the question, uh, if the question is, okay, they believe he's the Messiah, how did they conclude it that he was raised, lifted up and highly exalted in heaven? Well, it's because they infer it from the Old Testament. Right, but why would there, they must have a very high degree of confidence that they were right about him being the Messiah. And all the other cases where the Messianic claimant gets squelched by the Roman uh, authorities, uh, in this case, Jesus was targeted by both Roman and Jewish authorities, which matters. But in all the other cases where it's just the Roman authorities cracking down on these messianic claimants, they get killed, they get sent into exile, everybody scatters, uh, and they, they knew nothing, saw nothing about that guy. Why is Christianity different from those? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question, right? Uh, so I think this gets to a the question of why Christianity became popular, basically. Uh, which uh, resur the resurrection doesn't really explain, right? Like if you take historians who write about uh, the rise of Christianity, and uh, you open even Christian ones, right? And you open the books, they don't just say, well, Jesus was raised, right? They go on and uh, build arguments about various like political, social and, social and economic factors, which uh, led to Christianity become popular and not some other religions, right? Like both uh, Jewish messianic cults and other ancient religions. Um, so yeah, I mean, like uh, the question of why Christianity became popular isn't really explained by the resurrection, right? Uh, and um, I think uh, of, like a sincerely held by false, but false belief in the resurrection explains obviously the spread of Christianity equally well as a true belief, because whatever other reasons were in place would be in place even if Jesus wasn't raised. Okay, so obviously once Christianity gets to a, a certain critical mass of, of social status, then we can start considering sociological factors. I've read Rodney Stark, I've seen how that argument goes, I think a lot of it's plausible. Uh, but I'm talking about ground zero. We start off uh, with the, uh, the crucifixion happening. We have 12, 12 or so people, you know, 11 or so people whose Messiah is dead, you know, plus a handful of other very devout followers. Uh, by their own accounts, they scatter, something happens, they change their minds about him being dead. Uh, and then they actually convince people around ground zero that this guy is not dead, uh, which your, none of your hypotheses explain that. That was one of the things I actually made note of that uh, it doesn't explain. Uh, the resurrection does actually explain how it was that Christianity would make it farther than any of these other messianic followings. Uh, and why it would make it farther is because Jesus had appeared to the, uh, the disciples and uh, the Marys, and he'd also appeared to Paul, and these people were dead convinced uh, that he had in fact risen from the dead, and this explains why they would then go around preaching that. Um, again, the most probable thing, given the resurrection not happening, is Christianity stops. Uh, so I'm, I'm still not picking up on what yeah, your explanation sure, is. Sure. Why would they... Uh, yeah, that's a good question, right? So, uh, well, I think he concluded, he, oh, so Jesus is killed, right? Uh, the disciples scatter, and then they go back and they ask themselves, okay, why is it the case that God planned for the Messiah to be uh, crucified? So they go back to the Old Testament uh, looking for answers. And what they find is uh, the Messiah will be killed. Uh, he'll have nothing. Uh, then he will be highly exalted in heaven. Oh, who else is highly exalted? Well, the suffering servant of Isaiah. Uh, who's the suffering servant? Well, he sounds a lot like Jesus, isn't it? Right? Like he's tortured, he's despised, he uh, is counted among the wicked, and he's buried with the rich. He's despised and rejected. Uh, he's led as a lamb to the slaughter. Uh, and that's basically your New Testament the theology, right? Uh, he's uh, killed for the sins of others, and then kind of other things over time snowball around it. Like, for example, he's the uh, sacrificial lamp. Uh, the sacrificial lamp needs to be without blemish. Uh, so Jesus didn't have his legs broken because otherwise he wouldn't be without blemish. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, why they, uh, that's how it started, right? And obviously, uh, some people bought it, uh, but most people didn't buy it. It's actually, it's actually very interesting. If you look at uh, the spread of early Christianity, uh, it seems that it was most popular in large urban centers in the Roman Empire uh, among like uh, lower class and unprivileged uh, groups like uh, women, for example, slaves and stuff like that, outside Judea. And what's very interesting is that uh, it seems that like early Christianity actually spectacularly failed in Judea. Uh, and you can, for example, see it because uh, when you look at um, 
where various important early Christian fathers are from. It's, you know, Clement of Rome, Clement of Alexandria, um, Polycarp of Carthage, but there isn't anyone of Jerusalem, right? And I think this is very telling, and it's probably because um, most Jews didn't buy it. And the reason why most Jews didn't buy it and why it was the pagans who by and large were the first Christian is because the Jews actually understood the Old Testament the most. So they were the ones to realize that these connections are not actually very strong. And they were and why, not- So why did the disciples realize, I'm sorry to cut you off, I don't want to you know, yeah, yeah, each sure. other off here, but why on earth did the disciples then? Well, so because, they, they had to, because, had yeah, because allowed them, yeah, because allowed them to rationalize the death of the Messiah that they spent years And so why is nobody else when their messianic claimants fail rationalizing this hard? Yeah, uh, well, that's a great question, right? It's like asking, why is it the case that there isn't any other religion founded on the discovery of the golden plate? Well, it's because if someone thought of that after Joseph Smith, then it would be obvious that he's just ripping it off. And the reason why nobody thought of that before is because with everything, there needs to be someone who does it first, right? Like, uh, it could be the case. And again, this is like a very weak argument from silence because we don't actually have an equivalent of the New Testament for most of these other Messianic claimants because their religion wasn't popular, right? Like we don't have four different gospels. Uh, So like, it could be the case that for example, uh, they didn't think they should be evangelizing so they were not actively attracting followers and to, that's why the movement died out. Uh, it could be the case, for example, they, di- they didn't identify the Messiah with the apocalyptic son of man. Uh, they didn't identify the Messiah with the suffering servant. They didn't think that the Messiah is going to be a son of God, right? Uh, like there is a number of steps that you have to make in order for you to be convinced by this. Uh, and I think like it's plausible to think that out of the many uh, messianic uh, sects, one of them did that and the other ones didn't. And that's why uh, that one survived and not the other ones. All right, so going back to the start, there, there's a lot to unpack from that. Uh, Christianity it did begin mostly in Judea uh, at ground zero surrounding where these things were supposed to have happened. Uh, Tacitus confirms this in Annals 1544. Uh, we know from Pliny the Younger that, uh, at least within Pliny's territory around around modern day Turkey, uh, Christianity had spread. He says not only into the urban areas but also into the countryside as well. And so that that's relevant. Christianity, and we have indications, was also in the countryside. Uh, a lot of the most important early Christians, uh, including Joseph of Arimathea, who I think he just kind of hypothesized out of existence. Uh, and Paul, who's a really big one, th- these are not just lower class schmucks, these are very important, uh, very knowledgeable and very w- well respected people with a lot to lose. Uh, that's going to matter here. And I think you're under or you're under describing the extent to which uh, people in this Jewish society did have a lot to lose if they went along with Christianity. This probably has something to do with why it was so unpopular. Uh, the, the fact that it was as popular as it was is absolutely astounding. Uh, they, these are people in a newfound religion, uh, undoing a lot of dearly held Jewish practices, uh, following a, a leader who had really, really upset the Jewish authorities to the point of wanting to kill him. These are people saying that the Gentiles are now on par with the Jews who are bringing Gentiles into their ranks. Uh, there's a lot of reasons this wouldn't have caught on with the Jewish people. And there's also a lot of reason uh, that individual Jews wouldn't have had any reason to convert uh, to Christianity, including the original disciples. Uh, the fact that they would have been willing to latch on to this particular messianic claimant and say, this is the guy that we're going to hypothesize as having risen from the dead, uh, even though, and we're just going to make up that we saw it, uh, the the level of motivation they would have needed for that is just not granted from, uh, we, we believed that he was the Messiah. It is much more likely that it would have occurred that they, they saw their Messiah get killed, nothing happens, and they all move on with their lives. Uh, you, you, like you said, uh, a lot of Jews thought these kind of old messianic uh, passages were, were sort of a stretch. They, you, they thought that these didn't properly apply to Jesus. And so the question is, why would the disciples have stretched so hard? Why would they have worked so hard and sacrificed so much, been willing to face so much persecution for such a, an, an, an 
incredible stretch and then said things like yeah it was uh, two women who were the first to see Jesus uh, none of us believe Jesus was risen from the dead you're describing them as all they were as though they were all very devout the problem is they describe themselves as they as though they were all very much doubting and the fact and it's also interesting to note that there were major followings in Carthage and Rome and Alexandria very early on because we have a a following of Jesus all around the entire Mediterranean and a fairly uniform uh, religious movement that had been just moved to exist by tremendous effort in the face of impressive, uh, well, not necessarily impressive, but, but very severe persecution. Uh, I think you're downplaying the extent to, to which this is all very improbable if they never actually saw their Messiah raised from the dead. Sure. Uh, well, I think sorry, it's sorry, Camel. To yeah. go, if, if you want to ask questions as well of Kyle at this stage and go and move into like your cross examination of his position, uh, feel okay. Yeah. So, do, do, Kyle, do you want me to explain uh, to respond to this, or do you want me to just ask questions? Uh, I'm pretty much. We'll put this way. If I had anything more to say, I've forgotten it by now. Sorry, can you repeat it? If I had anything more to say about prior things, I've forgotten it by now. So we can just move on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, if I respond to it now, you will probably want me to. Uh, you want to. You will probably want to address it. But uh, so I'm just wondering if we, if, if I should uh, question you now or how yes, do you ahead, want to go about it? Uh, yeah. So uh, okay. So uh, just a couple of questions. So first of all, let's start uh, with uh, I think a straightforward question. Uh, do you think it's reasonable to conclude that the resurrection probably happened based uh, only on like a publicly available historical evidence without any like special powers or secret knowledge? So we're going to have to get into a distinction here between. Uh, First off, this is an inductive claim. Obviously, we're using uh, evidence and we're not forming an absolutely certain deductive argument. Uh, Richard Swinburne forms a crucial distinction between C inductive claims and what he calls P inductive claims. For something to be C inductive, we merely raise the probability of it uh, on, on this particular question, on this particular evidence, such that uh, this evidence is better explained by this hypothesis than this hypothesis. On the whole, however, it could be the case with other things considered that uh, this hypothesis is still not raised above 0.5, even if uh, given certain evidence or certain bodies of evidence, it is uh, uh, it does explain better. Um, given everything you grant that Yahweh exists, that resurrections exist, or that resurrections you know, can occur, that miracles can occur, um, I think the the body of publicly available historical data makes it vastly more likely than not that Jesus did rise from the dead. Cool. Um, if you don't grant that, then we need to have an entire conversation about the, the plausibility of theism, the yeah, plausibility yeah, yeah, yeah. of Christian theism in particular, and so that's going to bear on a lot of probabilities. So I'm, I'm comfortable making a p-inductive claim given the historical data with everything you grant. Um, I'd, I'd probably fall back just for the purposes of conversation to a c-inductive claim um, if you were to stop granting everything you grant in your paper. All right. Uh, so the next question would be, I guess, what, you are, what are you more confident in, that Yahweh exists or that Jesus was raised? What was that? Uh, w w which are you more confident in, that Yahweh exists or that Jesus was raised? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, the, the Orthodox That's claim is that Jesus is God. Jesus is Yahweh. So the uh, my, my initial re uh, response is just that they're equally probable, given my beliefs. So you don't think that, like, the possibility that Yahweh exists, but Jesus wasn't raised is zero? Uh, so there's two, there's two claims we need to distinguish between here. Uh, the, plot, the possibility, if it is the case that Yahweh exists, then given all... Uh, Orthodox readings of the Old Testament, there will be some sort of Messiah, uh, and uh, he will probably be raised from the dead. Based on what the Old um, Testament says? The question says? is whether that Messiah is Jesus, so we have to set that prior probability. I'm so, sorry, sorry. Um, so uh, you think that right. uh, based on the Orthodox reading of the Old Testament, you think it's the Old Testament says that there will be some kind of Messiah and he will probably be raised? Uh, yeah, I can pull up some lists of prophecy. I do have that list in front of me as well. Okay, cool. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, so I, I think if Yahweh exists, there's going to be some sort of uh, Messiah and he will die and be raised from the dead. Awesome. Okay. Uh, cool. cool. Um, so uh, you mentioned that you would place kind of the intrinsic probability of uh, Yahweh wanting to raise Jesus specifically as opposed to somewhere else, someone else, uh, pretty high. Uh, so what would be your best argument for thinking that Yahweh would be interested in raising Jesus at all? Uh, so this is going to hinge on whether Jesus is the Messiah, right? And so the thing is, we're saying, well, okay, so let's get back to a, a slightly different question. What is the uh, what is the likelihood of resurrection given our background knowledge? And that's not actually the question we're asking. What is the uh, likelihood of the resurrection of Jesus given our background knowledge of Jesus. Uh, well, if we if our background knowledge of Jesus is just that he's some random ordinary dude, well then sure, it's just uh, as likely as unlikely or unlikely as any of the other many billions of people that have existed. The thing is, we know Jesus is in some relatively special classes that don't include an awful lot of people. Uh, it is predicated of him that he was the Messiah. That exclude, that That class of people excludes an awful lot of people. Uh, he does satisfy at least some of these uh, messianic claims. We can say that with a reasonable degree of certainty, even if we don't grant the the really, the really yeah, so, uh, so, special so, sorry, ones. Uh, clarifying question. So sorry to interrupt. So you would place Jesus in the reference class of messiahs. Um, so how, like, how many uh, people are there in the uh, reference uh, class who, apart from Jesus? Who uh, claims to be messiah? Of uh, people who claim to be messiah, and of uh, and of who people thought they were messiah, include. Uh, including after they died, they went on still believing this person was the Messiah. Uh, there aren't very many people I know of of whom that is true. Uh, let's say my knowledge of uh, comparative religion, religions is shaky right now. Let's say Jesus is one of 10 people in that class. Let's say it's also very, very easy for people to get it wrong. They, there, there's a lot of messianic misfires. Uh, so, and even, how if many... we, even if we place the probability somewhere around one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand, it's not implausible for the evidence to be able to overcome that uh, low okay. probability. All right. So, uh, so if you play, you're a Bayesian, right? You talk like a Bayesian. I, I know a couple of things about it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, okay. Well, you should be uh, having a, a conversation on a completely different level then. All right. So, uh, so let's say that uh, for the sake of argument that there are like 10 uh, people in the reference class of uh, people claim to be messiahs, they get following and their followers don't like uh, abandon the belief after they die. Uh, and Jesus is one of the 10. How many people in that reference class do you think were actually raised? Uh, and well, the like question is, exalted, did, did... ascended to heaven and stuff like that. Yeah, so the question is, were any of them raised? Uh, has, has the actual messiah even come yet? Based on what we said so far, as far as prior probabilities go, we can't form a conclusion. What we need to do is actually look at the evidence. Well, sure, but like there are two different components, right? Like there's the intrinsic probability and then there is the evidence. So, and you're think you're saying that the intrinsic probability is like fairly high, at least not, it's not like astronomically low because you seem to think that if we place Jesus in this kind of reference class, then it's going to give us a high intrinsic probability. But I'm just wondering- Higher like, than if, if he was there... any random individual. Hmm? Uh, higher than if he was a random individual, yeah. Yeah, sure. And the motivation is that in the reference class, there are more people who were raised. Um, because uh, like, I, I'm granting for the sake of argument that there are bodily resurrections, right? Which means that there is actually a data set of resurrections that we can investigate. And it seems to me that for, of, for a lot of the reasons that people usually give for thinking that Jesus would be raised as opposed to someone else, uh, for example, that Jesus claims to be Messiah, uh, the other people who supposedly were raised did not claim to be the Messiah. And other people who did claim to be the Messiah were not raised. So I'm not really tracking how those kinds of arguments are raising the intrinsic probability. So we can say there's, there's all kinds of instances where people say someone is the messiah they you know they don't get raised from the dead whatever that's why we can still put this fairly low one out of a hundred one out of a thousand instead of just you know one out of ten if there's only ten people that this would properly denote so yeah. let's backtrack for a second i i 
if we didn't have the publicly available data about the evidence about the resurrection of Jesus or the you know historical data surrounding the question of the resurrection of Jesus, I probably wouldn't believe in any of the other biblical uh, re resurrection claims. There are plenty of other instances in the Bible where Jesus not only calls somebody up into heaven without dying, but there are other cases within the Bible where Jesus does or uh, where God or Jesus does raise somebody from the dead. I wouldn't believe those if it wasn't actually for this evidence. Uh, but the thing is, we can still say there is a very low prior probability here. We can set it at one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand. But if we go on taking individual pieces of evidence, the, the cumulative testimony, the testimony that women were the first witnesses, Paul's uh, purported conversion, uh, these will have a compounding factor on one another. And then we, you know, uh, okay, multiply sure. those as necessary, multiply those by the prior probability. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that, if this gets yeah, really top yeah. heavy, it can overcome how bottom heavy this is over here. Sure, I understand that. Uh, what I'm specifically asking for is why would you put it in like one in 100 in the first place, right? Because, um, like, as I point, like, it seems to me that, uh, and th there are a lot of these, uh, like, arguments, right? Like, Jesus led a sinless life. He was uh, a great moral exemplar. He's the paragon of, like, humanity or, like, the focal point of human history and stuff like that. And the, the problem is, as I, as I said in the opening, I don't really see, usually these arguments are circular. So they are smuggling the in the assumption that Jesus was actually raised. But in other instances, I don't really track how that being true actually raises is the intrinsic probability, right? Because there isn't any like abductive reason. And ju also just because it just doesn't bear out uh, in the data, all right? Like, because um, I, I'm, I'm just talking about other instances of the resurrection in the Bible. I'm talking about people who are supposedly being raised today. Like Craig Keener has a massive volume on miracles where he documents a lot of uh, miraculous claims with very good uh, evidence. And it includes uh, people who were supposedly raised from the dead, right? It's, I don't think it has any people who ascended to heaven afterwards. But the point is that all of those people who are supposedly raised are like little girls in rural Africa who don't claim to be the Messiah, are not moral, great moral teachers, don't live sinless lives and stuff like that. So even if I grant that those kinds of things are true about Jesus, I don't really see how that follows that Yahweh would be interested in that person being raised. So if you can explain that, that would be great. Falling into a trap that Hume falls into, I am not committed to believing every miraculous claim just because I believe some miraculous claims. I'm not obligated to believe every messianic claim just because I believe uh, one messianic claim. I can, you know, if you wanted to you know, open up Keener's book, I haven't read it, I don't own it, but if you wanted to at some point go through Keener's book together, I'd be happy to and give my opinion on some of these individual cases given the evidence. I suspect I'd probably be skeptical of at least some of them, if not a good number of them. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, really Hume, quick, so I would just like to yet. point out Hume, the Hume, Hume, Hume does complain uh, that you know, so many so many of these miraculous uh, events happen in these far gone, uncivilized, uneducated places. Hume was a little bit racist too, by the way. Uh, he, 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 make, he makes this complaint, but the thing is, Jesus's resurrection uh, happened with plenty of people talking about it. There, uh, there were very educated people by the day's standards talking about it. There were uh, high-ranking people who converted to Christianity by all accounts. And so that this isn't something we need to chalk up to some poorly uh, testified event in some long, long gone, uh, far gone place okay. where, you know, maybe they were just seeking social status, uh, something, you know, they, they, they didn't have the natural knowledge to realize that a rare physical phenomenon was at play that caused a healing rather than uh, the divine hand of God, all things can happen. I'm not obligated to believe those. And we also can't conflate the prior probability of resurrection, given our background knowledge of Jesus, with the prior probability of miracles, given our background knowledge of all the different miracles that have happened. Yeah, I, I would like to point out to the audience the interesting dynamic going on right now, right, where we have a... a little bit. <laughs> we have, uh, sorry, can you repeat it? 
Can you repeat it? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we, we broke up for just a second there. I can yeah, hear you now. Yeah, I, I would like to point to the yeah. audience uh, to an interesting dynamic going on where uh, an atheist is granting there are actual bodily resurrections and an atheist, uh, and a Christian is pushing back against that and saying that he doesn't buy them, <laughs> but it's okay. No, I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm not pushing no, back that, against I mean, actual resurrections. Yeah, I'm, that, that's I'm saying I'm not joke. obligated to yeah. believe in all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a, I, I just find it funny. Um, sure. Uh, right. Uh, so the... sorry, sorry to interrupt, Campbell. Just to yeah. say, feel free to go back and forth at this point as well, guys, um, and just okay. continue on the conversation. Yeah. So uh, I'll just ask you a last question, and I'll then feel free to to uh, question me maybe for the rest of the time if you want to. Why do you dislike Lacona? He's such a nice guy. Or why do you not agree with? Oh, him? look. I, I have no reason to dislike him as a person. He and I, he and I have sure. never met. I'm sure we could sit down over a meal or a beer or something and you know get along fantastically together. I, I reject his uh, view of this. I, I reject his scholarship, some of his scholarly claims about how we can rightly interpret scripture. Um, mm -hmm. There is a recent scholarly critique. Unfortunately, Lacona refuses to engage with it because he frankly resorts to some uh, ad hominem attacks. Uh, but there is a scholarly, a very long, thorough scholarly critique that was recently published by doc, Dr. Lydia McGrew. Uh, Lacona will point out that she has a degree in English literature, but she has spent a lot of time engaging with the scholarly uh, resources surrounding this. And she published a full, thorough, devastating critique of his theory of liter literary devices in scripture. Uh, if you wanted to take a few minutes and just you know, listen to Kyle's story time, I could read you a couple select passages that I yeah, that's all right. I'm very familiar with that. Actually, I did a review of an interview uh, of her about the book recently on Pine Creek's channel. And yeah, she's amazing. She does basically all the work for me because I don't have to go through what Lacona, Keener, uh, Evans and these kind of guys say about the literary devices. I can just take it from her book, right? So that's that's actually great. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine. So um, I don't know, go for it. Uh, I have a lot of notes, so just uh, pick one angle and then we can... Uh... Okay, so questions. Do you have anything to say regarding, uh, because at least in your paper, it appears just that you're saying Second Temple Jews would have believed people just raise, rise from the dead. That's not true. They rise from the dead at the end of the age. So what do you have to say in regards to that? Well, I mean, the Gospel of Mark says that uh, there were people, uh, including the Herod, for example, who thought that John the Baptist, uh, well, that Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead, right? And uh, the reason why they thought that, this is very interesting, is because they thought this is an explanation of why Jesus is able to perform miracles. They thought that he's able to do that because he's John the Baptist raised from the dead. So here we have an example of Second Temple Jews believing that someone was raised from the dead uh, before the end of the age. And that this means that he's uh, like more than a mere mortal. Uh, it's not really clear what they imagined could be the case they are imagining him like a divine figure or he was just given some like special powers by God. So yeah, I mean, it's just uh, contradicted by the New Testament. So it's, it's one thing to believe that someone was back from the dead. Uh, it's another thing to believe that someone was back from the dead by virtue of being a second temple Jewish person. Second temple Jewish people preached per their doctrine that at the end of the age, there would be these resurrections. Um, it's possible that as Second Temple Jews, they believed that, plus they thought there might be something really weird going on, or at least one person, at least one person, Herod, thought there was something really weird going on here. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that Second Temple Jews were a subset, they might, they might have been a dominant subset at the time, but they were a subset of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think that's completely possible, and I think uh, another person like that could have been Jesus. Right, so just as there were some Second Temple Jews who became convinced that uh, mistakenly that Jesus, John the Baptist was raised from the dead and they didn't think uh, this contradicts their existing religious beliefs, I think uh, a different group of uh, Second Temple Jews concluded that Jesus was raised from the dead and they are called Christians, uh, only Christians, right? Uh, right so I think that's fine. The problem is you take this Second Temple Jews thing and you're trying to make it do some explanatory work. It sounds like you're trying to make it sound more plausible that they would have thought somebody rose from the dead, qua being Second Temple Jews. In reality, they're just, you know, they're Second Temple Jews and just like anybody else, they might happen to end up thinking that somebody rose from the dead regardless of what their other doctrines are. 
Yeah, sure. I don't think it's just much more plausible than an actual resurrection, right? Like, uh, we know that Second Temple Judaism was fairly, uh, the uh, worldview was fairly, uh, like heterogeneous, there was a great plurality of religious beliefs. Like, for example, some Second Temple Jews uh, rejected resurrections altogether, Sadducees, right? Uh, so given this plurality of the religious beliefs, I don't think it's very implausible that uh, a small group of them that uh, failed to convince very many other Jews, they were much more successful with the pagans, uh, would conclude that uh, someone, uh, for a very good reason, would be raised before the end of the age, especially if uh, that's what the Old Testament says. So why do we uh, suddenly stop getting purported appearances uh, of Jesus? Why do we stop getting these sudden uh, Um, it's one thing to say that they are just seeing Jesus in the clouds. First off, why do we stop getting people thinking that they're seeing Jesus in the clouds and making a big deal of that? And also, why do we stop getting people saying that they bodily encountered Jesus? Um, do I have a second I, I don't think it ever stopped. Wanna, like, there are people seeing Jesus all the time. <laughs> well, the thing is, in, in the gospel accounts, Jesus is said to have risen into heaven, and we don't really hear much of Jesus appearing to anybody in any of the New Testament accounts after that. Uh, why is that the case? Even today, we get people saying, oh, I spotted Elvis somewhere. Um, we even have people who want to say they spotted Adolf Hitler in Brazil. So why do we uh, no longer get any major uh, claims I about well, I th I think we get Jesus? Get it, I, I think we get it consistently all the time, right? Like if you if you look, for example, at like New Testament apocalyptic, uh, uh, New Testament apocryphal literature, it's full of uh, instances where Jesus shows up. Like, uh, either... Yeah, I'm not talking about the third and fourth centuries. I'm still talking about the first century. Why do why do people in the first century, these very first believers, suddenly stop, uh, suddenly say, okay, this, we 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 have stopped seeing Jesus, and it's because he rose into heaven, even though we never saw him rise into heaven. I don't think that's the case. We we have no uh, first century accounts, and, and none of the New Testament accounts do we have uh, besides Paul. Uh, people saying, yes, I continued seeing Jesus. Uh, if, if people are just the revelation to... of John, the chapter one. <laughs> Uh, what was that? The revelation of John, chapter one. All right, yeah, so there's a difference between Jesus coming in a vision as opposed to these purported uh, bodily appearances. Yeah, yeah, that, that's because Jesus already ascended, right? Like, uh, it's actually interesting if you... Yeah, so why place... did they say Jesus ascended? That, that's that's the crux of the issue here, is why on earth would they even go go on and say uh, Jesus ascended? Why would Yeah, because say, that's what yeah, the Old Testament says. Yeah, that, okay. that, that's what they thought the Old Testament says, right? Uh, you uh, are raised you are lifted up and you are highly exalted in heaven. And if you are mm -hmm. raised bodily on earth, well, how do you get to heaven to be seated on the right hand side of God on his celestial throne? Well, you get ascended. Uh, that's what, that's like standard, right? That's what Elijah does. Uh, that's what like Moses does in some second temple writings. Um, yeah, I think that's and very so possible. After seeing their through. Messiah and friend uh, humiliated and publicly executed, they said, uh, well, we're just going to postulate that this happened because if we read the Old Testament this way, uh, Jesus is the one who did that, and you know, this is true, even though we haven't seen it, and we're going to say by literary device, which is, you know, Lacona says, uh, an accepted way of communication or getting accounts back then, uh, that uh, we're just going to say that we saw him bodily, even though we never actually did. Yeah, you are getting you are getting a handle of this, uh, and, and I think this is much. I think this is much more probable than Jesus not, actually being raised. <laughs> this is an entirely implausible story, though. This doesn't happen for any of the other messianic claimants. It doesn't happen any other time. There's a purported resurrection that's supposed to happen, and it, it, there's simply no motivating factor here for the disciples to want to do any of this. Uh, uh, also, I think there. I think there is. Uh, yeah, like uh, they were hanging with the guy for like years, right? So they were probably very highly, like, emotionally invested in him. And, and I think the guy become a social pariah. He was killed, and they're willing to go out and face almost certain death if they get caught because this guy was different. And so they make up all this. Yeah, stuff and I, I mean, like all as I explained, all of that is uh, perfectly explicable uh, by the hypothesis that they just they were trying to answer the question, like why on earth is it the case that Yahweh decided to have his Messiah uh, executed, humiliated, and killed? They You're assuming that they system. assumed this was the Messiah, but my, my very point is, and I, this is something we're gonna keep coming back to, I guess, but my very point is nobody else, once they're 
Messiah was killed still assumed it was the Messiah. And there are plenty of perfectly natural reasons to assume that anybody who saw their Messiah killed would no longer assume this was the Messiah. So what on earth yeah, yeah, yeah. had these people so certain? Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question, right? I, I think I've already uh, addressed that. But like, first of all, it's important to realize that this is like an argument for, from silence, right? Because we don't have that many accounts about um, these other messianic claimants. And like, imagine, for example, if Christianity didn't, didn't become popular, like, for example, Paul never converts, uh, the Gentile mission doesn't happen, and Christianity dies over time because Jews don't buy it. Uh, and so like, imagine, for example, that if all we knew about Jesus was what's found in Josephus, for example, uh, we wouldn't know almost anything about New Testament theolo theology. We wouldn't, for example, know that Jesus called himself the son of man, all right? Uh, even if you assume that you know, testimony of Flavianum is actually authentic. Uh, so that's a really weak, weak argument from silence. And then uh, there are different reasons why Christianity became popular. And so... as I mentioned, uh, yeah, I think the, the reason why all of the other Muslim claimants were not successful is because Christians were the only ones who pieced together from the Old Testament the story that allows them to rationalize what actually happened. They came up with a story and you are telling that's repeating that story uh, for 2000 years. Why is it the case that um, Yahweh uh, decided to have uh, the Messiah uh, executed, uh, humiliated? Uh, because, you know, he died for your sins. Uh, you took the sins of he took the sins of humanity on himself. He was cursed by God. He was executed. Uh, this was uh, perfectly according to the plan. And here's all kinds of uh, passages uh, in the Old Testament where you can see this being foreshadowed. Uh, yeah, I think this is much more probable than a resurrection. Well, the problem the problem is we're starting to get into a circular argument there. But the thing is, we we have accounts of uh, the Maccabees brothers. We have accounts of uh, I believe his name was Ben Akbar. Uh, these other mess uh, of these other wildly popular uh, Jewish leaders, zealots, uh, messianic claimants, um, and we have accounts that once they were exiled or killed, people would actively deny. This isn't just an argument from silence. We have these old accounts that people would actually deny having known these people. Uh, so just to be clear, it isn't necessarily an argument from silence, but I do want to ask one question at some point. I feel free to respond to what I just said, but I also want to get to the question at some point. Uh, you, so, so it sounds like you also have issues with Lacona, but also you rely on his literary devices, understanding of scripture, and you, you hypothesize all kinds of instances where the uh, gospel authors uh, or the New Testament authors used literary devices. So I'm curious what from Lacona you accept and what you don't. Uh, well, yeah, I think uh, Lacona basically doesn't go far enough because he is uh, basically pushing uh, against uh, additive harmonization, right? Like, so when you have, for example, the infancy narratives, the problem obviously is that uh, half of the details uh, only appear in one gospel, the other half only appears in the other gospel, which is very implausible if you think uh, they were actually written or uh, based on eyewitness testimony, right? Like, Can you say that one more time? I didn't quite catch it. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that, so um, I think that Lacona is be he's basically pushing against uh, additive harmonization, right? So for example, um, you have the infancy narratives where the problem is that half of the details is only found in one gospel and the other half in the other gospels, which is very implausible if you think that uh, this is based on eyewitness testimony, right? Like did Mary forget about the flight of, to Egypt? And that's why it's not in Luke? Oh, probably not, right? Uh, so uh, Lacona thinks, okay, I need to come up with something much more plausible to explain the differences. He finds about literary devices and he says, okay, this is great, that works as an explanation. But the problem is that when it comes to the resurrection appearances, he doesn't go there, uh, he doesn't go far enough. Uh, then suddenly he needs to harmonize. He says, well, the gospel according to Luke says that Jesus told his, their, his disciples to stay in Jerusalem, but they ended up going to Galilee anyway because other um, gospels situate the appearances uh, to Galilee. Uh, and I think if he was consistent, he would say, just like uh, the infancy narratives are probably largely invented because little was remembered, 
Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, at least some of the things from the resurrection appearances was invented as well, which obviously didn't mean that the resurrection didn't happen. It just means you cannot rely on the particular details, like uh, Jesus eating a piece of fish in front of 12 people, or 11, or how many uh, there were, uh, for like as evidence, right? So, one thing you mentioned here, I, I have the exact, this is funny, we have the exact opposite uh, approach to Lacuna. I think the harmonization, I, I'm willing to grant that there are small details that might be uh, just irreconcil irreconcilable in different accounts. Um, that's one thing. So before we go any further, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of J. Warner Wallace at all, a forensic detective, has helped many notoriously difficult cold cases. Yeah, I am. Uh, he, he, gives, if, he gives a lot of interesting uh, input on testimony. And he would say, look, before we, we can question these witnesses, don't let them talk with one another because he would want to hear the differences in their testimony. He'd want to hear the different points of emphasis each one of them had. And it is perfectly, he said, it's implausible to expect this. I think the opposite is true. I think there's good reason to think it. Uh, it is entirely plausible that when you have multiple people talking about the same event, different people are going to place different weight of memory on, on different points. They're going to recall different points. They're going to talk about it in different ways. You say, well, why in the Gospels aren't these really important things mentioned that are mentioned over here? Well, I don't know. Why didn't Ulysses S. Grant mention the, um, oh gosh, he didn't mention the, uh, dear gosh. Yeah, I mean, I get what you're trying to say, right? Like, I, but I mean, uh, you can only take this so far, right? Like, did Mary forget about the slaughter of the innocent? Uh, did she forget about the flights to Egypt? Did she forget about the story? Right, right, right. So here's the thing. This is, the thing is, this isn't necessarily Mary, Mary writing. Uh, here, but like, uh, hang on, Emancip yeah. Emancipation Proclamation, by the way, is a thing Grant didn't mention that we'd perfectly expect him to mention. Um, I just had to get that out, so it's going to bother me otherwise. Uh, so you mentioned the, the idea that this uh, infancy narrative was just made up. Uh, well, there are interesting reasons to think that's not the case. There are uh, interesting parallels in some of the infancy accounts, uh, specifically in Matthew and secular history, that would just be really strange to have this uh, kind of lining up of things if it was all just made up. So for example, in Matthew 2.22, we have the reference to uh, Archelaus, Joseph hears that Archelaus is in power, he's fearful of Archelaus. Well, we actually find out in Josephus in Antiquities 16.9.3 uh, that Archelaus had come to power and he had slaughtered 3,000 Jews in the temple. Uh, mm -hmm. So we actually have a lining up here. We have a reason for why and Joseph would have been afraid of Archelaus. Can, can, can you think of a way how a detail that's found in Josephus would find its way into the Gospels? <laughs> so here's the thing. What you can do is hypothesize somebody inserted it later on. No, uh, I'm just thinking that, like, for example, uh, the Gospel authors were obviously using Josephus as a source. And there is a very strong evidence for that. Uh, probably the strongest with Luke. Um, where, yeah, I think that's just a uh, case closed, right? So you like, introduce okay. another hypothesis. So there, there's, a, there's yeah, a major sure. problem here, and this is going to be my general, this summarizes my general complaint with your entire project. You, your argument, your structure of hypotheses and probabilities takes on the exact same form as a, a, uh, a conspiracy theory uh, model of explanation. Um, this is positing all of these individual hypotheses hypotheses without independent evidence to think any of them actually occurred is the exact same thing that Holocaust deniers do is the exact same thing that uh, flat earthers do to get around all of this evidence. And the problem is, and actually it's interesting, I just want to remember this, uh, you saw the article, Richard Carrier kind of calls you out on a lot of this gerrymandering that is apt to happen when you suggest all of these sub hypotheses without independent evidence, especially when you fail to entertain why they might be implausible in the first place. So the entire the problem is this entire project involves all of these frankly, ad hoc seeming uh, explanations. And we can give explanations for anything. It's just the problem is they should have some sort of independent uh, evidence or independent reason for thinking yeah. probable, uh, let alone be implausible by their own right. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, definitely true. Um, well, the, the problem is that uh, you have to always compare it with the alternative explanation, right? So yeah, that's true that I'm just, uh, invoking a lot of things uh, kind of um, ad hype, um, 
you know, um, uh, how do you say that? Uh, like ex hypothesis, basically. Uh, but uh, like they are, they function basically as a hypothetical or theoretical unobservables, right? Like uh, William Lane Craig would, for example, say that this is what physicists do all the time. Like you don't have to actually uh, observe an atom. You can just postulate it as a, an explanatory entity to see if it uh, can account they, for all have, the That's evidence. the thing is it's, they, they have all kinds of independent reasons to think that atom is there. Well, yeah, but because it explains the evidence, right? Uh, so. That's the explanatory power that you go for. You, but you are perfectly fine to just make up like a physical force, for example, and if it accounts the evidence for the evidence, which in this case would be the results of the experimentation, then you are justified in believing that uh, the model is actually true, that it corresponds right. so this to reality, like dark right? matter. But here's here's the problem though. We we postulate dark mar dark matter. That's uh, yeah, that that's shaky enough. Um, but most physicists I've talked to. And I've talked to a couple would you know, say that, and maybe I'm wrong on that. If physicists actually think the existence of dark matter is a shaky thing or not. But uh, once we start saying, well, there's dark matter, plus there's dark matter prime, plus there's dark matter prime prime, and we do that 20 times, which you've done here, uh, you, you start to run into really tricky issues with plausibility. And uh, yep. especially when you've granted that Yahweh exists, when you've granted that resurrections can occur, I see no reason yep. to think that a very elegant, harmonious explanation, such as the resurrection, should fail uh, at the hands of something kind of scotch taped together this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I definitely agree that this is what I'm doing, but I still think that even if you take all of those things that I'm invoking as just theoretical unobservables, and you take their intrinsic probability and you multiply it, you still end up with a posterior which is much, much higher than the resurrection hypothesis, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I definitely admit that. And the reason why this doesn't work with like conspiracy theories, Holocaust denier and stuff like that is because there the alternative explanation, which is like the true explanation is actually is actually a very high probability, right? It's got very high prior probability because like the Holocaust is not as intrinsically improbable as a resurrection. And also uh, the like official story still ends up explaining the evidence much better. But in this Why case, we the, have, yep. There, there's Sorry. only been one Holocaust in human existence of all of the human events. The Holocaust is incredibly unlikely. And well, sure, but that's that true about everything, right? that. So why is the resurrection less likely than? Oh, well, that, that's true about exactly. everything. That, like, that, there, exactly was, the there, there was only one of uh, like every event, right? But the, like the thing is that I right, can- So these prior probabilities are cheap. Uh, yeah, well, I, the thing the is, like, I can, that's exactly the problem with the straight rule, which I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I can predict with like very high confidence. I can actually even bet a very high amount of money that if I take this pen, I sit it on my desk, then in the next 10 minutes, yeah, I is not going to decide to like miraculously send it flying across the room, right? Um, so yeah, you understand. So the difference between making predictions and explaining something that has already occurred, right? So here's the thing. If someone tells you there's a person who married a person somewhere in the world, predict what the wife's name will be, or what one of the spouse's names will be, you would never predict that it was Evelyn Aguilar or seemed to become Evelyn Hewitt. There's no way to think that is even close to plausibly the case. Case. But if someone said, oh yeah, this is the person who married Kyle, here's her Facebook page, here's the marriage certificate, what's the best explanation for it? That her name is Evelyn Aguilar. Perfectly normal evidence overcomes these insurmountable yeah, uh, I agree, all the time. but it's yeah, I agree, but it's not that's not the case with the resurrection, right? Uh, because in that in that specific case, like uh, even the fact that the person makes that claim in the first place is like sufficient evidence that this is probably true. But if like imagine if we for some reason ended up living in a society where people just like again for like a weird cultural reason, uh, habitually lie about who they married. Well, in that case, the prior probability of that claim being true would be so low that even that amount of evidence would not be sufficient. Uh, so I'm just saying like, you have to compare like, similar kinds of claims, right? And that there is absolutely no problem placing uh, an event like the Holocaust in a reference class such that the prior probability is fairly high, right? Even if the whole, uh, even if the uh, reference class is very, very 
specific, right? Because we have well-documented instances of genocides. Uh, there are like necessary conditions that, I met, that are met. For example, we know that uh, you know, Germans had the technology and stuff like that, right? Like if someone, for example, uh, visited the Holocaust as an explanation for something that happened in antiquity, we would dismiss it because we know that like Romans didn't have railroads and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, uh, like uh, the reason why conspiracy theorists fail is because the official explanation is usually pretty straightforward. It's like very intrinsically plausible, but it's not very difficult to come up with an explanation uh, like alternative explanation to the resurrection and you can afford to be very ad hoc uh, because you are just coming up against something that is very intrinsically improbable. So even what, very what, like- What do you mean said, by intrinsically uh, improbable? Sorry? What do, you, what do you mean by intrinsically improbable? Uh, it's just the prior probability is low. Okay. And okay, so yeah, the prior yeah, probability the is low like it is for yeah, anything else I'm, in the world. I'm just, I'm just uh, grant like I'm just treating inter intrinsic probability and prior probability as synonyms. Um, it's okay. just uh, like the the probability of the claim being true on background knowledge alone, independent from the evidence. So there's only been one Holocaust. There haven't been terribly many things like it. There's only been one messianic resurrection, assuming there has been one. Yeah. Well, sure, but that's true about every. Why can why can evidence event, lead us right. to believe in one but not the other? Sorry. Why can evidence lead us to believe in one but not the other? Why can evidence lead us to believe that I married Evelyn Aguilar but not that the resurrection? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, like the, the way how you usually uh, estimate a prior probability is that you take a reference class and you place the hypothesis in question into the reference class. And it's a balancing act between having a large sample of similar hypotheses in the reference class and the other hypotheses in the reference class being like sufficiently similar to your own, right? So if we wanted to estimate the prior probability of something like the Holocaust, we would probably uh, look at other instances of well, like mass large scale genocides. Uh, we would put the Holocaust into the prior probability. We would probably find out that there are like many instances where these genocides actually happened and like very few instances of an international like Jewish conspiracy trying to guilt white people into giving up their freedoms. So we would include uh, conclude that the prior probability of the Holocaust is very low. Um, yeah, uh, the, sorry, the, the prior probability of the Holocaust is very high. The problem is there's some circularity going on here in this placing into classes of things. If we place the resurrection, the purported resurrection, into a class of things where people are going around lying all the time, that is operating on the assumption that people are actually lying in the case of the resurrection. Uh, well, I mean, you tell me uh, what the reference class is, right? Because you mentioned that you would like to use a reference class of people who claimed to be messiahs uh, gathered following and the followers continued to believe the messianic claim uh, even after the people, the, the person in question died. And you said, let's say that there are 10 people in the reference class. So how many people in the reference class, including Jesus, were actually raised? If just one, if it's just Jesus, which I think that's your answer, then again, the probability is slow. Because I think even if there were hundreds of people like that, you would still think that Jesus was the only one who was raised. And how many genocides uh, have there been 6 million people killed, particularly 6 million Jewish people killed? Mostly Jewish uh, yeah, people. Th th this is so, what so I here's, mentioned, here's, right? Here's the issue here is we can make this, yeah. the, the problem with relying on these reference classes is you can make them as narrow or as wide as, no, as you want to. <laughs> no, actually, because, uh, yeah, you can always tweak the reference class so specific that it only has the one claim in it, which is the claim in question. This is trivially easy to do with any question, right? right That's why I mentioned... Sorry? Which is why this, again, why the straight rule fails. Uh, well, no, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, there is a trade-off between how many cases, how many like sufficiently similar hypotheses you get in your reference class and how similar they are going to be to the hypothesis in question, right? So of course, there was only one genocide where exactly 6 million or whatever, however many uh, Jews were killed. Uh, that's not a problem, right? Because we can just, uh, construct reference class, which is going to have additional cases, additional instances of genocide in, 
is just going to be less similar to the Holocaust than all of these other details, right? And you can do that with the resurrection as well. The problem, it seems to me, is however you uh, set the reference class for the resurrection, Jesus is always going to be the only member who you think was actually raised. So it doesn't matter pretty much how you tweak it. Um, the resurrection is always going to end up being very implausible. Uh, the, unless the, you- the only, the only messianic person who you think was raised. That's gonna be an important part there. Sorry? You said no matter what class you choose, you're gonna say Jesus was the only person raised. That That's not technically true. Jesus is the only messianic person raised from the dead. Christians, there are plenty of other people raised from the dead within scriptures. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, but like you can't <laughs> you can't uh, select the difference class so that it only contains the yeah so, so here's the here's instances the of the hypothesis being true we, we, can, so we can strew the, the purported resurrection as something that happened in the class of all things where an event was caused by something sufficient to cause that event yeah yeah yeah, we, yeah we, sure we can... like obviously obviously yeah, yeah that, that that's absurd right like uh, you, yeah obviously you can construct a reference class so that any event is probable but the problem is that if you have to do if the, the only way how you can do it is by uh, defining it as extremely vague, then I think that's reason alone to believe that <laughs> the event in question probably, like the hypothesis in question probably isn't true. Okay, so run me through one more time uh, this reference class that you think uh, the, the resurrection or the background knowledge concerning the resurrection that the general hypothesis falls into. Uh, which one, the the, uh, the uh, resurrection hypothesis or my hypothesis? All right, so uh, the, the the resurrection of Jesus. What reference uh, class is that? Well, I mean, that's hypothesis? that's kind of your that's kind of a question on you, right? Because like, uh, what, like where would you put it? You're defending it. I'm just saying that, so like, from natural theology, we can just say that, yeah. Yahweh doesn't raise people very often, and there are attempts to like uh, point out some features of Jesus specifically that supposedly raise the prior probability. Uh, so you would place him in a reference class based on those reasons, like uh, I don't know, people who are uh, focal points of human history, or uh, people who are great moral, moral teachers, uh, people who claim to be the Messiah, and stuff like that. Um, but it seems to me like uh, however you uh, define it, uh, Jesus always comes up being the only member of the class who you think was actually raised and ascended and is now sitting on the right-hand side of Yahweh. Next so to people his, who, who believe that Jesus is the Messiah believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that there's only one Messiah. That doesn't seem terribly controversial to me, but there, there's two important things here. The first is uh, you're, you're falling back again on a claim, well, God doesn't raise people from the dead very often. So what makes Jesus so special? Well, I think there's anything special, special about Jesus. Uh, well, there's an entire body of evidence that we can give. Uh, you should look at the McGrew's article on the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. You want to talk about natural theology. This is in the okay. Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Uh, so is that the one where they just uh, say that like the likelihood ratio of one person dying because of the resurrection is a hundred to one and they multiply it by the number of disciples. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, I think you pr you should definitely reread that one. You're gonna okay, want to read yeah. that. I one. will make sure to anyways you're falling back you're 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 you're, you're falling back on a problem. I, have a ten I, I don't get married very often. I have a tendency to not get married. I just married one person. So why would, on earth would we ever think it's that one person? Well, we look back in hindsight and I have a marriage certificate. I have plenty of pictures from it. Sure. So, so I think Jesus was just was the one who happened to be raised from the dead. Well, we have uh, people who, so here's the thing. What, what, kind of what kind of evidence would lead you as a first person observer to think someone rose from the dead? Uh, you know who they are, you know that they're them, uh, and you can tell a, a, a live person from a dead person. So first person, this isn't very hard to overcome. So the, the hard question comes when, what, what happens when this becomes testimony? What do we do as people listening to the testimony of people who claim to have encountered someone who has risen from the dead? Uh, presumably, if they actually believe it, it'd be really hard for them to be wrong about it. The question is if they actually believe it. Uh, 
if they're going out and putting their, their lives and status on the line, uh, and if these are respected members who have, of society who have a lot to lose, these are people who would stand in a position to know that he was dead if he was actually dead and know if he was alive, if he was actually alive now. Uh, the, this te not all testimonies created equal, and this particular testimony can be weighted very heavily. And yeah, what the Magruz do is they say, well, we have this person saying this, and that's evidence. We have another person saying the same thing as well. Uh, and this is very strong testimony given all these criteria. Uh, that's also evidence. We can we can we can multiply that to get a very strong evidential factor, and there's no reason uh, to think that that's an invalid move as far as evidence goes. Yeah, I, but I think the the problem is that with all of those pieces of evidence, I think the likelihood ratio on the different hypotheses isn't like 100 to one uh, in favor of the resurrection. I think it's about one. So if you multiply about one by like 12 people, you still get the uh, likelihood ratio of about one, right? Uh, because they just uh, assume uh, without actually arguing for it that this is the uh, likelihood ratio and they actually don't uh, seriously evaluate any completely competing hypotheses. And as I said, I can explain perfectly well how a sincere but false belief in the resurrection uh, like how it came about, uh, which means all of these other pieces of evidence become like equiparable on both explanations. Uh, so you have to default back to the prior probability. Uh, and it seems to me that you are, you just keep shifting before uh, between the prior probability and the evidence, right? Uh, and I think you are saying that the prior probability is high because there is the evidence, but the problem is that these are two like mutually independent things, right? And so in Bayesian analysis, you have to establish what yes, the yes, prior this. I'm not, I'm not conflating the two at all. I'm well aware that the prior probability is different from the evidence. What I'm saying yeah. is that the prior probability, even if we keep it incredibly low, uh, it's still even, overcome even, by even, if, yeah. even, even if we keep the evidence that I married my wife uh, incredibly low, that can very easily become oh, be overcome by perfectly normal evidence. And yeah. if we keep it incredibly low, that of all people to be to be raised from the dead, it happened to be Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that can overcome this very, very, very low prior probability. And I do think there's reasons to raise that prior probability. Uh, it doesn't have to be even a high prior probability. It can still be a very low prior probability. This, I think it is plausibly significantly higher than one out of billions on billions. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, but the, can, but the thing can I here... Just... Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, so, so, I think this is a good point. So going back to your hypothetical about you marrying your wife, right? So what would be an alternative explanation that accounts the same evidence accounts for the same evidence. We wanted to fool the world that we got married for some reason. Um, okay. Uh, well, was, yeah. I, I, so I wasn't totally done. There's, yeah. there's one more point I want to get. No, so, so, to sorry. Uh, I, I think this is important, right? So we have two competing hypotheses, mutually exclusive. One is that you actually did marry her. And the second is that you wanted to fool the world, right? Uh, both of them uh, explain the evidence equally well. The problem is that the probability of the one is much higher than the other, uh, again, based on our background knowledge, because we know from experience that when people make claims about who they married, it's much more often the case that this is actually true, and it's very infrequently the case that they are doing it in order to deceive the world, right? Uh, so I think this is uh, like pretty similar to the resurrection. Uh, I think we have uh, multiple hypotheses on the table. I think mine explains all of the evidence at least equally well. Uh, the problem is that uh, yours uh, has a very low prior probability. Uh, yeah, so again, that low prior probability is an issue, an issue because of what I'm just about to say. Uh, first off, you're basically giving me grist for my mill here. Um, it, in human experience, when somebody is willing to die for an empirical claim that they believe, uh, they do actually believe it. Uh, and yeah. in the case of these claims about the resurrection, it'd be very hard for them to actually believe these empirical claims uh, and be wrong about the truth of them. So this matters. Uh, we, we compound the fact that we have, you know, however many pe uh, people believing this, this is very strong uh, compounding evidence, uh, gives a very strong Bayesian factor. Um, why is it the case? Look, I, I already said earlier, the odds of all 20 or so of your hypotheses coming together, and you're gonna need to add more for other things. The odds of all 20 of your hypotheses coming together is point zero 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 nine five if we grant that they're all starting at 0.5 uh probability uh, 
actually that's, the resurrection not that's, occurring. That's, but, but here's the problem. Sorry. I think you, I think your your flag your flagship hypothesis is in, incredibly weak. I think it'd be generous to say it's even point one given the resurrection not occurring, because what you're basically saying is I come along and say, yo, I'm the Messiah. You say, okay, cool. I get absolutely slaughtered. And then you're like, oh, he was the Messiah. Um, well, why would this happen if he was the Messiah? He must have been raised from the dead. And then you go about sacrificing life and limb, convincing people, and it's miraculous that you even convinced anybody that I was actually raised from the dead, even though I was just a random guy who told you I was the Messiah one time. And for some reason, you kept believing it after I got killed, even though we have all these examples of this not happening for any other people. Why on earth should I think the Old Testament hypothesis is, is plausible? Yeah, I think this is still much more intrinsically probable than Jesus being actually raised, to be honest, yeah, right? Like, for, I think I think we are just though. yeah, I think we are just running in the circles, right? And also, it's important to realize when you are multiplying these probabilities that you are just assuming that the probabilities are mutually independent, right? But that's obviously not the case uh, because they are not mutually independent, right? Like one uh, component. I don't think it's obviously the case that they're not mutually independent. How does how do any of these hypotheses that you give and make any of the others more likely? Uh, well, likely. we would have to go uh, look at the individual interconnections, right? Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I think uh, they, they mutually support each other. Uh, okay, but, so... uh, yeah, uh, but I, I would have to, uh, like I would, wouldn't be probably able to do it off the top of my head, to be honest, but this is something for me to work in the future to like come up with some examples. Yeah, you're of... gonna wanna give work on that because I don't yeah, see yeah, any I'll... intrinsic connection between uh, you say I postulate ex hypothesize that Jesus was not actually given a decent burial by Joseph. How does that make it any more likely or unlikely well, for that Jesus was yeah, buried that, in that, the church that, Yeah, that's a good question, right? So like, for example, uh, the first Corinthians 15 appearance, uh, I think that's that uh, component of the explanation being true makes it much more probable that the appearances narratives in the gospels would look the way they do if the resurrection didn't actually happen because the gospel authors would receive uh, from like other Christians the tradition that uh, Jesus appeared to uh, his disciples shorter, shortly after they died, right? So if my component of the explanation behind 1 Corinthians 15 happens to be true, uh, then the probability of the gospel uh, appearance uh, appearance narratives in the gospel isn't independent from that. Uh, so that's just one example, right? But I, that, that's actually a good uh, outcome of the discussion. Uh, it's just me uh, looking into this, right? Uh, that's very productive. So thank you yeah, for that. I, I will say that there is one small issue here. Uh, Jesus uh, not actually being given a decent burial by Joseph of Arimathea uh, rules out one very, 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 very small part of not R. There's a lot of other ways Jesus gets buried. You know, any other random guy in Judea gets him a burial. Uh, that there are plenty of other hypotheses. There, there's no reason to think that this one thing getting ruled out makes Jesus be being buried in a trench grave anything more than negligibly, and I mean negligibly, more no, so it's just no. That, that, that's just more the most probable based on the background knowledge, right? Because it's just uh, how crucifixion victims were buried if they were given a burial, right? So if you imagine the probability space, it's not like we <laughs> partition the probability space so that like every random Jewish person had to, gets the same space because he could be the one who buried Jesus, right? Like a fairly large amount of the probability space on background knowledge alone is covered by that. Uh, just based on like the historical record, right? And right. somewhere so, like in the corner, there would be the burial by Jesus of Arimathea. If Jesus was any random guy, then maybe uh, being buried in a trench grave was uh, more likely. But as it stands now, this is a just so story. A dearly loved messianic figure and friend and public leader uh, being buried in a trench grave could have happened or it could have been the case that somebody requested his body as actually did end up happening and somebody as well known as Jesus, it's not entirely uh, uh, unlikely that that would happen. So again, there, there's no reason to think that this is something that was by itself very likely. Uh, this is just a, a just so story and granting a point five probability but, to start with is being generous. By the way, why would uh, Joseph of Mar Ar Arimathea bury Jesus? Um... Uh, it's implied and it's possible that he was a uh, devoted disciple of some sort. No, it actually says that specifically, I think, in the Gospel of John. Um, yeah, because I, I think that's uh, kind of like uh, contradicts what you were saying before, right? Like on one hand, you uh, want to say that the disciples would have no um, 
no uh, reason to follow Jesus if he claimed to be the Messiah, but then got killed. But here we have a disciple of Jesus who buried him, uh, presumably in his own tomb. So why is it the case? Why is it the case that he didn't like uh, abandon Jesus just like everyone else? If Jesus was the Messiah and he got killed. It doesn't make much sense if it doesn't make much sense if Jesus didn't actually, you know, do the things you'd expect the Messiah to do, right? Uh, yeah, but the, the problem is that, like, the um, burial by Joseph of Arimathea is a part of the same narrative that I'm not granting. I'm just saying that, like, internally, that doesn't make any, oh, well, it, that, that, not that it doesn't make any sense, but it uh, goes against what you're saying elsewhere, right? Uh, because you are saying that, like, on one hand, the disciples would abandon Jesus immediately when he was crucified. But on the other hand, no, you have a disciple who actually uh, gives him a decent burial. So why is it the case on your uh, story, let's say, that... Uh, oh, okay, so you're, you're conflating two things see. here. Yeah. Yeah, you're conflating two things here. It's there, There's a huge difference uh, between going around saying this guy is still the Messiah uh, and he has risen from the dead, as opposed to just saying, okay, yeah, uh, you got us, but let's at least give the guy a decent burial. He was a decent enough guy. But those are two very different things. And I, I do still think it's more likely that Joseph of Arimathea would even care if Jesus actually went around doing the things the Messiah was said to have done than if Jesus was just a random schmuck saying, I'm the Messiah. Okay, can you repeat it? Uh... Yeah, so there's a... The last, yeah, the last part, uh, the, it's unlikely that Joseph of Arimathea would do what? So I'm actually blanking myself on what I just said. Let's hope this gets at it. Well, that's, I mean, that's all right. Like we don't have to um, argue about that. Uh, that's I think a uh, fairly minor point. Um, yeah. I don't know, like, is there anything else you wanted to touch on? Oh, I think we're probably, uh, getting around close to Q and A time with the chat, probably. Yeah, I was going to say I've got loads of questions from the chat for you guys. Um, if you want to move on to that, yeah, yeah, sure, let's go for it. Okay, um, so from my list here, then let's just go back to the top. So, out of one hundred religious claims of resurrections, how many do you think are actual resurrections? Out of one hundred claims of fictional stories of resurrections, how many are really fictional? Who is the question? Um, it does. It didn't come with a thing, but I'm. I'm guessing. Um, I mean, I mean, both of you feel free to come in on that one. Um, I guess it's kind of pertinent to your position, Camel, talking about prior probabilities and things, and your position uh, as well. So. Yeah, I think I think uh, it's a very small number, <laughs> for actual resurrections. Uh, I think it's uh, like when even if you just construct the reference class of. Uh, resurrection claims, uh, the proportion of actual resurrections in the reference class is going to be very small. It's a very like it's much more often the the case that uh, the resurrection that, that the people are just uh, sincerely mistaken, right? And th there was a video uh, long t uh, not long time ago of a resurrection uh, taking place in Africa. And some uh, Christian apologists even covered it, uh, like Mike Winger, for example. And he, he said, well, obviously, you can see that the guy is faking it, right? You can see him uh, moving and stuff like that. So, the, the, But the point is that like, it's not very good evidence, shouldn't convince anyone. But apparently, uh, very many people were honestly convinced that this is a real resurrection after watching that video. And this is true in the 21st century when we are educating people about critical thinking, and there is almost universal literacy, we have all the information, almost all the information immediately accessible. So imagine how much worse that might have, must have been in the first century Judea, right? Sure. So I'll, I'll push back on that. Uh, yeah, I was gonna... I'll, I'll agree with the general sentiment that of, of all the purported resurrections, the actual number of resurrections is probably very, very low. Uh, but there's a difference between a guy laying on a table wholly intact and rising from the dead, as opposed to a guy getting flogged however many number of times, getting nailed to a cross, being left out to die, getting a, a spear shoved through his side, all these things which people seem to believe happened to Jesus, and then still being said to have risen from the dead. Uh, these details matter an awful lot as, as far as the strength of the evidence goes. 
Yeah, I agree with that completely. I think the swoon theory first proposed by Christians is a, a terrible explanation for the resurrection. Yeah, even Christians have had some monkey ideas. <laughs> True that. <laughs> Awesome. So um, this next one is for you, Kyle, I think. Um, and it's um, where does Paul give any evidence of the risen Christ uh, being experienced in um, a different way than through a vision? Uh, Paul specifically? Uh, my knowledge of the Damascus Road encounter is too shaky to say if this qualifies as a vision or as a bodily encounter yeah, with that, Jesus. Paul never mentions the Damascus Road experience, by the way. <laughs> uh, so here's the thing. We have good reason to think the Damascus Road Yeah, I know what you're going to say. Right. That's, that's all right. That's all right. We don't have to go there. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, what, what was the question just one more time um so it was uh, where does paul give any evidence of the risen christ being experienced and that's kind, it's kind of worded weird in the typing so i, I think yeah. he means um other than like through a vision uh to my knowledge paul never had an experience of this sort you know like thomas uh reportedly had where jesus is physically in the room with them and you know jesus invites him to come you know, you know encounter with him physically yeah I, if I can address this real quick, it's an, actually interesting that if you put together various resurrection appearances, even from like uh, New Testament Apocrypha, and you put them into the internal timeline, like within the texts, right? It's very interesting that the physicality of the resurrection is only there before Jesus ascends. Everyone that Jesus appears to after his ascension, that's always non, not non-physical, right? Um, that's uh, just an interesting observation. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I have nothing to add. Okay, um, so the next question, and I guess this one's more uh, for you, Camille, is I wonder if anyone here is angry with Jesus if Jesus were real. So are you angry with Jesus if he were real? No, I, actually, uh, I think uh, that would be great if Christianity was true. Like, re really, like, if I had, it's one of my favorite religions. Uh, I think if I had to put together, like, a list of top 20 religions, there is a good chance uh, Christianity would come close to getting to the list. Um, so no, I, I mean, uh, it would be great. Uh, I, I've never been a Christian myself, and I just happened to be born in a country that has been <clears throat> more uh, measured as being the like least religious in the world. So I kind of treat that possibility as like an exciting uh, hypothetical, right? Like, wouldn't it be cool if people could, I don't know, teleport uh, or something like that? Uh, but yeah, I don't have anything uh, against Christianity. It's definitely not the worst religion uh, around right now. Yeah, hopefully this isn't disappointing to anybody in the chat, but I don't have a whole lot of interesting things to say about the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no problem with Jesus being real. <laughs> no, um, so then the next one, um, doesn't the fact that some claim John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, uh, Mark 6, 14 to 16, show that the idea of a single dying and rising prophet figure existed before Jesus? I think we already addressed that, right? Both of us. Yeah, so these people, look, if, if John existed, it was strongly rumored uh, that he performed miracles, or if he did perform miracles of some sort, granted, I don't think even Christians believe that he did. Uh, if somebody's going around performing miracles, like they didn't have social media or Wikipedia back in those days, if word had already traveled around widely that there was one guy of, who these, of whom these things were rumored, then people might be inclined to say, what, is he back from the dead or something? What's going on? Um, and it's not just that they, these were messianic figures uh, or prophetic figures necessarily raised from the dead. There actually wasn't, uh, there weren't any prophetic, prophetic figures that I know of raised from the dead. There were uh, only a couple that we referenced that are brought into heaven without having died first. Um, but there's no reason to think a Jewish person wouldn't have thought that maybe God had raised a person from the dead. Uh, they were willing to, to hypothesize that. But it's also interesting that nobody continued to go around believing that uh, John the Baptist had risen from the dead. Yeah, there is actually an Abrahamic religion where John the Baptist is the main prophet. Yeah, they are called the Mandians, and they are still around. Mm. But really? I don't think, yeah, I don't think uh, the, um, 
I don't think the uh, they think that uh, John the Baptist was raised from the dead. Um, mm -hmm. And also, that it's it's a question whether the religion even goes back all the way to antiquity, right? It uh, it's probably uh, started later. Uh, yeah, I, I think you mentioned that uh, John the Baptist is, didn't perform any miracles. Uh, who leapt in the womb? Uh, was it Jesus or John the Baptist? I believe John the Baptist. Well, there you go. It's a miracle, right? Uh, the kids don't <laughs> normally do that. Um, uh, but it, you, you know. Yeah, kids kick in the womb all the time. I, th I think the the. Well, I, I think, think we it's have, implied. Here's the, the thing: we don't we don't have John doing pirouettes in the womb. We have John, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, reacting strongly to the fact that the yeah, yeah he had some yeah, sort yeah. of sense that God was there. God was giving him yeah. some sort of sense that he was there. That's not necessarily a, a, a suspension of anything John was capable of doing. It's just God was manifesting Himself to John. Sure. And so far as God manifests himself, it's a miracle, but as far as John is responding in any way an uh, unborn infant is capable of, it's not miraculous. Sounds legit. Okay, so um, the next question then um, for you, Kyle, is did you believe in the historical case for the resurrection before or after you first became a Christian? Uh, uh, so, no and yes. I was raised Christian in late middle school, high school. I basically walked away from it for a time. Um, I eventually became aware of the historical case uh, in large th case, thanks to Tim McGrew. Uh, and after that, I returned to Christianity. Oh, can you just tell me how old you were when you uh, walk uh, from Christianity and how old you were where you returned? Just out of curiosity. Uh, these are going to be, my teenage years were a blur. <laughs> so 13, 14, when I was, you know, when I walked away, I was walking away and then probably 16, 17, when I, you know, came, came back. And the thing is, you know, I, I, ne I never had like a, a whole, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll phase. I never stopped going to church. It just became a very almost kind of Nietzschean legalist sort of thing that I didn't really believe any, any factuality about. Would you, was there ever a point in time where you would say that the, the resurrection like didn't happen? Oh yeah, there was a point in time where I would say God probably doesn't exist, the resurrection All right. probably cool, didn't cool, happen. Cool. Yeah, yeah just, just, just to uh, like um, give my two cents on the question, there is a challenge that I have for Christians. We don't have to talk about it now. It's just, I want to get it out there because I would love to get uh, an answer. You find me a person who uh, became a professional historian first um, and then became a Christian based on the historical uh, evidence for the resurrection, right? Because the thing is, everywhere everywhere you look, you all either find people who have always been Christians, are not professional historians, or they become Christians for some other reasons, right? They were convinced by some of the general arguments for uh, theism, and then somehow concluded that Christianity is true and not some other religion. Uh, and I think this is actually very unexpected because if the uh, historical evidence for the resurrection was really good, you would expect that uh, the people who would pick it up first would be the people who are best trained in uh, investigating history. Uh, but this is not actually the case for some reason. Uh, so two things. The first is the, arg the argument that not everybody is persuaded by an argument, therefore, that said argument is bad is not necessarily a good argument. People can be persuaded of things for all the wrong reasons. Um, we, we do have professional historians who are Christians. We do have professional historians who are uh, non-Christians uh, in some you know, form or other. Uh, Rodney Stark, uh, Christian historian, historian who became a Christian as an adult convert. I can't tell you the reasons he would give. What was that? Uh, he's, he's not a historian. He says, I was never an atheist, but I probably could have been best described as an agnostic. He calls himself a cultural Christian. Uh, so he, if you ask him, like, uh, if you go back in time, would you be able to record Jesus actually raising from the dead? I think he would probably answer no. Uh, also, he's not a historian, but, you know, he's close enough. Uh, I'll be happy to give him, like, an honor. Yeah, I, I would have no problem calling him a, a professional historian. I, I'd have to look more into his personal beliefs. Um, 
Yeah, because yeah. It, the, 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 the problem is that like a lot of people like Dave Ellison, you know, like various other the usual suspects like John Dominic Ross and obvious and stuff like that. There are they are people who obviously affirm that Jesus was actually raised, but they will have no problems telling you that uh, you can't use historic the historical methods to conclude that this is probably true, right? Like, right. They yeah, are, they can be scholarly right. disagreement about that. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they are just like, uh, you know, uh, pragmatic, uh, or they are, uh, you know, presuppositionalists, or they are fideists and stuff like that. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is really uh, surprising, is that like, if the resurrection was actually well evidenced, you would expect to actually see a lot of historians who look at the evidence and conclude that this is probably true. Uh, so it's very unexpected to see what we actually see, which is that uh, if you f happen to find a historian who is a Christian, who either was always a Christian, or he uh, became a Christian for some other reason. I really, I've been looking for a very long time, and I have like an impressive list of people, and it's never the case that they actually became Christians for because of the historical evidence for the resurrection. Um, yeah. Uh, one one Cam Camille to add to your lif list, um, someone in the comments section put, uh, Jürgen Spies is a German historian who became a Christian after studying history. His parents brought him up to believe that everything politicians, priests or journalists said was false. Um, okay, uh, I'll have to make sure yeah. to look up the, uh, the name afterwards because I don't know how to spell that, but that's fine. Uh, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think it, it's Jürgen with like an umlaut on the U and stuff, um, and the double S on the end of Spice. Um, so then the next question is, how many historical eyewitness accounts do we have uh, for seeing the resurrected bodily G Jesus, an eyewitness who identifies himself in the first person and writes that? All right, so we're going to have to distinguish here between, uh, I we have this person's eyewitness account and they have signed off on it versus we have strong evidence to believe that such and such eyewitnesses existed uh, based on these accounts which corroborate their existence. Uh, so Matthew, uh, okay, so nobody signs off on the gospel saying, or no, of, none of the eyewitnesses, reported eyewitnesses sign off on the gospel saying, I, Matthew, wrote this book, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, I can't remember if the same as John. I believe it's the same for John. Yeah, it's the same for John. Um, we have, yeah, I don't think any of the gospel accounts, Paul is basically the only one in his accounts who says, I, Paul, am um, this to you because such and such a reason. Uh, John of Patmos is another one. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, well, there are others. Uh, it's just they are not in the Old, New Testament, right? Like uh, the Gospel of Peter, uh, it specifically says, like, I, Peter, and my brother Andrew uh, went uh, somewhere. And uh, then, unfortunately, the manuscript is corrupted. Uh, but I think like, we can uh, conclude reasonably well that it probably had some resurrection experiences, right? Given that it actually narrates the, the resurrection. Uh, yeah, as, far as, the, as far as the documents we've discussed today go, uh, yeah, 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 sure, Paul's, sure. Paul's the only one who self-identifies himself. Okay, so I guess this is one that's open to both of you, but primarily Kyle, I think. Um, it's if, if, if it were true that Jesus did not rise from the dead bodily, uh, what would be your explanation for the evidence we have in the New Testament? Well, that's unlikely. <laughs> uh uh, if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I don't think we would have, again, on resurrection not occurring, on not are, the most likely thing to happen is absolutely nothing. Uh, it turns out just like any of the other messianic claimants. Sure. And uh, like, um, what's the, because you, you would obviously have to grant that all of the other explanations, including mine, have some like vanishing list more probability of being true, even if it's just uh, astronomically low given the evidence that we have, right? So I think the question is, which one of these astonishingly small probabilities is the highest? And the other question is, is it my hypothesis? <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, Camille and I, I, I apologize, is it um, more properly pronounced uh, Camille or Camel? 
Camille. Camille is it's, it's, it's me who pronounces it wrong. Okay, and I'm yeah, so sorry. Yeah, yeah, feel, we feel, probably feel, have different feel, yeah, pronunciations feel, and accents. I just wanted to make yeah. sure I wasn't like you know, right. giving so you a different name than you actually to, have. Yeah, feel free to overpronounce the I at the end. Okay. That's okay. how uh, foreigners usually end up avoiding pronouncing it as a camel. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what, are you, what were we talking about? Okay. Yeah. Um, um, where Camille and I are going to disagree is that uh, I don't think, even though we start off with a very low prior probability, I have a, a view of the evidence that it can very easily overcome. That uh, on principle, evidence can very easily overcome astronomically low prior probabilities. And you know, Camille and I have gone back and forth over what we should even said the prior probability. Um, I, so I, I don't grant that we're choosing between two astronomically unlikely hypotheses. I think that given the evidence, this hypothesis is quite likely. Uh, no, that's, that's all right. Like, uh, yeah, uh, in, in your view, the probability space is almost entirely covered by the resurrection hypothesis, right? So if you imagine right. it as a pie, char pie chart, it would just be one color, basically. But even you would have to grant, I think, that there is a very small segment in the pie chart where all of the other alternative explanations are. It's just all of them combined account for a very small proportion of the probability space, given all of these amazing evidence, right? What the question is asking, which one of these alternative explanations do you think has the highest, but still astronomically small, probability of being true? I think this is a very important question. I, I think yeah. you should uh, you should think about it even for other religions, right? Like, what's the best explanation for Mormonism being true, assuming right. uh, naturalism, for example? Right. Uh, yeah, but, I, so... I thought about that one a little bit. Um, I, wrote, I, I wrote a paper on that one in college. That one was fun. Uh, that doesn't make me an expert. I'm not saying that makes me an expert. It was just a fun paper. Um, I would probably have to go with some version of an imposter hypothesis. You get some, you know, less than totally sane person who just wants to, you know, be a goofball or he has some sort of mental delusion. And it just so happens he looks so much like Jesus, he can pass himself off as Jesus and somehow this happens. I'd probably have to side with something like that. Or, you know, they, the disciples just happen to see this guy who looks an awful lot like Jesus in the, in the supermarket, whatever, something like that. Uh, is probably the most likely hypothesis given naturalism. All right, I, I think it's it's terrible. It's much much less probable than my hypothesis, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> you obviously disagree on that. Oh, well. Yeah. Okay, so um, the next question then, and I've only got a couple more in the queue, um, and I don't know how much time you guys have got left or the battery um, on your mic, but. Um, why do the resurrection narratives evolve over time? Uh, Paul visions, Mark, empty tomb, no appearance report, Matthew, first appearance report, Luke, much more physical appearances. So um, what are both of your takes on that? Harm some harmonization, probably, additive harmonization. And also um, you would have, you expect uh, the uh, eyewitness accounts to be different. That's how you can tell they are eyewitnesses. They don't agree with each other. Uh, no, I'm just yeah, being facetious. Go, go, yeah. go for it, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah the, the important thing here is there's a big difference between not agreeing with each other, contradicting one another, and having you know discrepancies between the accounts, things that you know could be harmonized plausibly. Um, and I'm, I am willing to grant that maybe there's just a couple of really small points, like this disciple ran and got to the tomb first versus this disciple ran and got to the tomb first. Like at that point, uh, if if we say that two accounts contradictory, contradict each other on that ground. Um, that, that doesn't really shake my faith in the rest of the evidence very much. Uh, I'm going to have a whole lot of people coming after me for my low view of inerrancy, I'm guessing. But um, that was facetious. Please don't actually come after me for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, one narrative we can tell, and I kind of view this as a just so story, is that the, this Jesus, the, the original claims about Jesus, I think Barney Armand takes something like this route. The original claims about Jesus is that he was a Messiah, but not the kind of like God-like Messiah we've come to think of him as. And, you know, the earliest didn't think he'd rise from the dead. He only became deified over time. And eventually people started saying he was full-blown risen from the dead. The later people who said this superimposed it or read it back into the early accounts, something like that. That's an account. I think it's unlikely given the data that we have and how it is that these different uh, manuscripts have come to be quoted and accepted among the earliest churches and church fathers that we have records from. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think this is actually exactly what you would expect if the resurrection appearances were actually not uh, uh, like uh, accounts what what happened, right? Uh, and this is independent from whether Jesus was actually raised, because it could be the case that he was raised, but the resurrection appearances don't actually correspond to reality. That's also possible, right? Like, but it's this is completely so. If you have three people who don't know about each other, who are both. Uh, trying to come up with a plausible account of Jesus appearing to his disciples after his death. And they share some uh, similar stories maybe and some similar background beliefs. Like for example, he was raised bodily. This is what you would expect to get, right? You would get different appearances in different locations, the different people, Jesus doing different things, saying different things. But this is completely unexpected on the hypothesis that this is being reported by the people who were there, right? Like why on earth would Matthew, an apostle handpicked by Jesus himself, not uh, record uh, Jesus appearing to his disciples uh, in Jerusalem, in the upper room. Did he forget about it? Was it not important? Did he run? This is something actually that Blake Kunta said uh, in the debate that I had with him, that maybe, you know, he ran out of manuscript. And that's why he didn't, he had to like abridge it. I think he said that about John, who is uh, also supposedly an eyewitness. So yeah, that, that's so um, why, why did Ulysses Grant not mention the Emancipation Proclamation in his two volume memoir of the Civil War? I remember the word Emancipation Proclamation that time, by the way, I'm proud of myself. Uh, you know, we don't know why he didn't mention it. It's incredibly strange that he didn't mention it. He just didn't mention it. Um, sometimes these things happen in history. Sometimes there are quirks. Sometimes eyewitnesses just recall different things as they're recalling important events. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, it's it's possible. I'm just saying it's not very probable, right? Like, and pointing out one instance it's where something very have, improbable doesn't happen. If we have multiple happen. eyewitnesses, if we have multiple purported eyewitnesses recounting an event, we should expect uh, some sort of discrepancy, not contradiction, but discrepancies really? among the narrative. Because it, it, look, if they all sound exactly alike, that's when you'd start thinking, okay, this sounds an awful lot like collusion. At that point, you have an entirely different problem. Yeah, but would you would you expect the level of discrepancy that you actually, like think about it, right? These are the people who are like seeing it with their own eyes. They are reporting it. They are writing like presumably the most important account in human history. And they're just like, ah, I'm not going to mention this. Or did he appear to us in Galilee or Jerusalem? I can't remember. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so you should look up, perhaps you've already read it, but this is just to the general uh, audience. Uh, look up the, uh, the work, including the McGrew's work on undesigned coincidences. Um, they also take on a lot of these issues, but undesigned coincidences provide positive evidence that this is something like natural you know, eyewitness testimony that we, we should expect to find. Yeah, uh, I, I, you can find those even in fiction. Yeah, so uh, trust me, the McGrews are thorough. Uh, yeah, look, at, take a look at their work, see what they have to say. Okay, guys, um, I've got four more questions from the chat, and then I've just closed questions off from people now, so that should. Um, yeah, I think I think we should so. probably answer them like more uh, quickly. Uh, sure. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, can we? <laughs> yeah. I will. I will try my best not to be inflammatory. <laughs> um, th this one for you is saying, uh, "What's your evidence for mass graves?" Uh, th yeah, that's actually a good question. Uh, he, in here, I'm just relying on uh, like uh, historians of antiquity, uh, like modern historians that uh, investigate burial practices. Uh, I think the latest scholarship on that actually says that the most plausible. Uh, like the most common way of disposing a uh, crucified body would be a trench grave, not a mass grave, right? A mass grave would be mass graves would be more common in situations where you have large amounts of people being crucified at the same time. Okay, and then um, Kyle, for you, there's um, if a loved one died last week and your own wife says to you that she saw this person touch and talk to the deceased, uh, would you believe her testimony? And if you do not believe your own wife, why would you believe the New Testament? Um, I would be seriously skeptical. I would probably have a very hard time believing her. And I would probably uh, think there was, uh, you know, some sort of very tragic issue with her mental health going on at that, uh, at that point. Um, hopefully that doesn't get twisted around into some sort of crazy, Kyle doesn't trust his wife sort of thing. But look, uh, all the time, if uh, people say, yeah, I, I saw this person risen from the dead, I, I had a bodily encounter with them, 
sometimes we just say people are very wrong about something. Now, if two people come to me and say, well, uh, that this happened, we both encountered them, uh, it, it gets weirder, but then, uh, you know, I, I might raise a little bit more of an eyebrow, but I'm still not gonna believe them. Um, we, we could, look, here's, here's the problem. I'm a huge fan of thought experiments. I work with them all the time in philosophy because that's all philosophers do for a living. Um, we can construct thought experiments where we can take the same criteria that Christians use to uh, say the, ev the evidence suggests that belief in the resurrection is justified. And we can come up with these fantastic, uh, you know, figured or uh, fake cases where all of that obtains. The big point here is that those things aren't actually true. We have to imagine them being the case. And I would say they, they, they don't actually obtain, they don't occur for a reason. Uh, because the things that happened that, you know, make me think belief in the resurrection is plausible uh, are very rare and can only really be explained by uh, the resurrection happening. And things like the resurrection don't happen very often. And almost in all cases where there's some sort of uh, miracle, the proper definition of a miracle is that this is something God is using to show, you know, a worker's sign to validate someone or something he's trying to get across to humanity. If... Uh, God came down and, and I had just an a, uh, incredible vision of God saying, I will do this, this, and this, and I will raise these people from the dead. You know, that raises the, the probability that maybe my life is telling the truth if, the, if these things correspond, but there's a reason these things don't happen. They are rare and they're rare for a reason. Sorry to go so long on that. Yeah, no, it's all right. Absolutely fine. Um, so then last two questions. Um, since the Gospels, Acts, and Epistles clearly state that Jesus was supposed to suffer, die, and resurrect according to the scripture, wouldn't it have been expected by the disciples? Uh, say that one more time. Uh, since the Gospels, Acts, and Epistles clearly state that Jesus was supposed to suffer, die, and resurrect according to scripture, wouldn't it have been expected by the disciples? Uh, this is doing something which... Uh, you know, Camille and I have gone back and forth over, uh, and to put it in different terms, this is a reversing of the causal arrow. We have the Gospels because the disciples thought something happened. Uh, it's not the case, or I don't think it's the case, I think it's highly implausible that the disciples thought something happened because the Gospels came before them, they read the Gospels and became convinced these things happened. In which case, it's unclear in what sense they're even disciples. Uh, they'd have to be disciple imposters. So yeah, my uh, favorite, to uh, sorry, come on. I was going to yeah. say uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had something to say about that, but I think that would just start another discussion. <laughs> Maybe let's leave it to the after show. <clears throat> okay, um, so the last question then, and I'm going to leave this one open to both of you because you might want to talk a little bit about um, the implications as well. Um, if we unearthed a gospel written by Jesus himself, dated to the early first century, would you want to include it in the canon? Can I go, go first? first? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, the first thing I want to say is uh, it would the prior probability of Jesus writing down something and then allowing it to go for 2,000 years completely unnoticed and unknown about uh, seems very low and it's very unlikely to me. Uh, that would make me very skeptical that this is an authentic work. If for some weird reason, if some probably borderline miraculous piece of evidence came down that told us this is something definitely written by Jesus, then I think we should have a very, 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 very serious conversation about putting it in the canon. It's just, again, I, I think there's a reason we don't have this which is that it doesn't exist and if it came to exist it would probably be questionable merit yeah i, I would basically agree completely uh, it's interesting that if it was actually discovered the new new testament uh, scholars would have no way of uh, knowing that it was really written by jesus right like what they would say would be wow what an interesting piece of new testament apogrypha look the forger even sign it uh, in jesus's names so that, uh, that's fascinating right <laughs> and but the the reason why they would conclude that is because it's very unlikely that something like that would not be preserved by uh, christians right although who knows like all kinds of weird things happen all the time 
Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for your time on this, guys. Um, I appreciate the kind of back and forth that you've both kind of engaged, I think, charitably with each other's positions. Um, and hopefully everyone's kind of gained something from it. Um, so I'll go ahead and end the live stream there. Is, is there anything either of you want to say um, just to close, maybe maybe a quick um, 30 second summary of how uh, you think things have gone? Yeah, after show on your Discord, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. And then I, I will I will save my closing statement for that because you have to, you know, incentivize people to participate. Okay. <laughs> All right. You guys go have fun with uh, Camille. Unfortunately, I got to go make sure that uh, my wife and I don't become homeless. Got to go make some money. Um, <laughs> thank you, right. Nathan. Th thank you, Camille. Uh, it's been a blast. No problem. Thanks for your time, both of you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Right. <laughs>